The Wonderful World of Dark Lords. Report 19. Olympus. I emerged from the mists to a scene of utter chaos. The city streets were black with acrid smoke, and I could hear the screams of the wounded and the dying. Somewhere came the thunderous crash of a building collapsing. I hurriedly cast fly to elevate myself above the smoke and fire, and was greeted by a horrific sight. A towering monster with three heads, those of a lion, a goat, and a fire-breathing dragon. It beat a massive pair of bat wings, fanning the flames, as its ravening leonine jaws gnashed together on fleeing human prey. As I racked my brain for some kind of spell or trick that could help these poor souls, the swirling clouds of smoke parted to reveal a man mounted on a flying horse. He charged forward, holding a trident on which he had skewered a massive lump of lead. The dragon head opened its mouth wide, and the man thrust the lead down its throat. As I watched, its eyes bulged, and I realized that the lead was melting from the heat of its breath, simultaneously choking it and burning it from the inside. With a roar of agony, the creature burst into flames, and the man's horse swooped around it in a victorious arc. I expected cheers, perhaps even tears of gratitude, and to be sure, some of the survivors ran to the hero with cries of delight, but others walked away as though these events were no stranger than a passing thunderstorm. I even caught sight of a man taking bets on how and when the hero would meet his demise. The more time I spent in Olympus, the clearer it became that heroes are commonplace here, but few, if any, can go the distance. Welcome to Wonderful World of Dark Lords. I'm Tom. I'm Rachel. And we're discussing how to convert Disney movies to Ravenloft Domains of Dread because creating a dark and soulless underworld based on beloved works of animation is probably the closest we'll ever get to going to Disney World. Along the way, we'll look at the Dark Lord, the domain itself, and some plot hooks and adaptation ideas to integrate this setting into your own campaign. Today's episode, Hercules. Woohoo! Ooh, zero to hero. Here we yeah. go. All right, that but beloved cult classic of that <laughs> kind of late, just going out of the Renaissance into the 2000s. Mm-hmm. If you saw on the name of the domain on the DMs Guild write up, or even just in the show notes, we are calling this domain Olympus because Pretty we need something reasons. right. We need something that people look at and say, oh, I get what they're doing. It's not ancient Greece, (laughs) because that doesn't really work to have, oh, welcome to our domain Mm -hmm, of ancient mm -hmm. Greece. (laughs) And also, like, Hellas would be a better term, but we want people to know, so make an instant connection. We don't don't have to Google, oh, I guess it's Greece. (laughs) So we just want people to see this and go, boom. Ancient Greece domain. So yeah, it's not it's not just the mountain. It's it's Greece. Right, it's, we're just using that as our term. <laughs> it's Thebes, for, it's Athens for it's everything. The yes. whole shmuel. The, the whole shmuel, as for, as Hades might say. <laughs> and speaking of Hades, we have been wanting to do this for a while because Hades is a great villain. Mm-hmm. Because pretty much one of the things people love about this movie, that love this movie, and a lot of people love this movie, is Hades mm-hmm. as a really unique, very dynamic, charismatic, fun. Disney villain. That's exactly the kind of thing we're looking for, for a good Dark Lord. And also, because we're going to go into, Hades has a lot of really good qualities of a Dark Lord. Yeah, yeah. So we were working on this for a while. There's two, kind of two big problems, and the first is the obvious one is so high concept. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but we'll kind of like try to couple different ideas for how to do this, and then Rachel like, cut the Gordian knot. Like Alexander. Because <laughs> yeah, the whole like having a Dark Lord that's a God, like that's that's tricky, and like it, there is my my fellow grognards. If you're going, aha, I can name a dark lord that's a god. Yes, I can too. He's one of my favorites. But they, he's coming up. He's coming up. But it's we can't have Hades be locked in a portal, unable yeah, to influence yeah. everything, guys. So, and we'll talk more about the kind of those struggles we went through and how we ended up adapting it in a section we like to call the Lord. The Lord. According to its residence, Olympus, which is also called Hellas, was once part of a world of gods and men where fickle and fallible deities might choose a mortal as a champion or lover and then cast them aside for the pettiest of slights. While this world is less than ideal, the temple clerics told me that the previous one was even worse, ruled by monstrous beings of pure chaos called the Titans, who were overthrown by Zeus, the king of the gods. The gods of Olympus were as venal as any mortal, but lacked the active, destructive malice of the Titans, making them a preferable alternative. I say were, because the gods have not walked in Hellas since the mists claimed it. 
Instead, they hide themselves away on Mount Olympus, with only one taking an active role in the lives of mortals. Zeus's brother, Hades, the god of the underworld and the jailer of the Titans. I urge my patron to cast aside any associations of awe or grandeur he may have at hearing the word god. From the accounts I heard, Hades is more fraudster than fiend, pursuing deals with mortals with all the slimy, sweaty energy of a carnival huckster desperate to fleece one more rube before closing. Like Facilier, he shows some interest in accruing favors for their own sake. Of course, unlike Facilier, he has little need to parlay them into wealth or social standing, as even such a small god as Hades has no need for such frivolities. Instead, many of his more purposeful deals appear designed to feed into one of two grievances. One is a grudge against the other gods. As Lord of the Underworld, Hades does not live on Mount Olympus, which is said to be a paradise. The other is a particular animosity toward heroes, whom he often tricks into one-sided deals or pits against his indebted pawns. According to legend, a true hero can ascend Mount Olympus and become a god. Perhaps it is envy that motivates Hades to ensure no mortal will ever claim the home he believes to be rightfully his. So our Dark Lord, as mentioned above, is Hades. And we, as I also mentioned above, we did this because we think he makes a great Dark Lord. He has a lot of qualities we look for in a good little Dark Lord. So let's kind of lay out what we're talking about. Let's explain what we're talking about. But first, let's, let's go back even further. You know who Hades is, either from a Disney animated movie or just from millennia of classical mythology mm-hmm. and culture. Actually, speaking yeah. of the the millennia of classical mythology and culture, with some of these with these domains, we do kind of the idea of like this is the domain of Robin Hood, not necessarily right, Disney's yeah. Robin Hood. This is the domain of Peter Pan, not necessarily Disney's Peter Pan. With this one, there is like some general Greek mythology stuff, mm-hmm. but we are really leaning hard into no, it has to be this Hades. Yes, yes. Because people really like Hades. You like this Hades, and this one is so divergent mm-hmm. from the classical, the archetype. Yeah, yeah. Like Disney's Peter Pan, we could say this is an iteration of that Peter Pan character that then we're kind of just following a little back to the source material. Or same with Prince John. Right. Like, there's there's a straight line from Prince John and Ivanhoe to Prince John right. in Disney's Robin Hood. But this is such an idiosyncratic, unique take on Greek mythology, and even specifically on the character of Hades. Mm-hmm. This is not the Hades we see in almost anything else yeah. in Greek mythology. Yeah. So it's very much, no, this is Disney's Hades, is our Dark Lord. So we are going to be bringing in some elements of Greek mythology that aren't present in the movie, but I apologize if you clicked on this and you were really excited because you were hoping that this would be kind of like the general Greek mythology domain. Everyone loves Hades. Everyone yeah. loves this Hades, and so we gotta, we gotta work with that. It just pretend it's a different god called Blue Flame Guy, <laughs> <laughs> Just go with it. Yeah. So, Rachel, what is a dark lord? Well. Before I was so rudely interrupted. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> well, a dark lord is an evil being who commits some kind of act of ultimate darkness that makes the dark powers say, why, hello, new friend, we want to play with you forever. And so they pluck that evil being up and... And they place them in a domain that is a special hell created just for them. There are some good Dark Lords. There are some not good Dark Mm -hmm. Lords. So we've come up with four qualities that we really think separate the Strahd von (laughs) Zaroviches from the Altheas. You're going to be hearing more about Althea later. I'm excited. I don't know who that is. (laughs) No, you don't. (laughs) Most people don't. (laughs) I'm your surrogate. I'm your viewpoint (laughs) character, dear listener. (laughs) I'm just as excited as you to hear who this person is and why it sounds like she is a bad dark lord. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the first quality is that act of ultimate darkness. They do a specific bad thing that leads to them becoming the dark lord. In Strahd's case, it was that he killed his brother because he wanted to get with his brother's fiance. Our second quality is what they call in Van Richten's Guide to the Torment. Since we're a Disney podcast, we call it they got what they wanted, they lost what they had. In Strahd's case, it's that, you know, congratulations, Sergei's out of the way. You you know, you have eternal youth. You thought that maybe that was why Tatiana wasn't into you. But now you know that, no, Tatiana was not into you because of you. Because of who you are. Because of you. And she will never be into you. Never, ever, ever. The third quality is some kind of element of tragedy or relatability. Um, They're not just evil for the sake of being evil. There's something about them that makes us wince in sympathy. And, you know, in Strahd's case, 
You heard that in Winston's sympathy. Yeah, that, right. Yeah. That She's... she would rather throw us off of a cliff than be with mm-hmm. you. That just, that's, that's a little rough. Yeah. A little rough for the old selfish Dean. And then the fourth quality is that the domain reflects the Dark Lord and their curse in some way. Uh, Strahd is the Dark Lord of Barovia. He is not the Dark Lord of a creepy, silent labyrinth island filled with statues because he's a Medusa who turns them all to stone. Like Althea. Okay. <laughs> all right. Cool. <laughs> One piece of information for the cork board. Who, once again... Wait till, wait till parting thoughts. You're going to be hearing more about Althea later. <laughs> um, that domain does reflect her, though. It just wouldn't reflect Strahd. Mm-hmm. And also, it reflects that curse of loneliness. That it is this boring mud slump that he will never find someone who's his intellectual equal because he's lonely without Tatyana, and he's never going to find some other woman to replace Tatyana because Barovia is boring as all heck. Mm-hmm. I gotta tell you, that labyrinth full of statues with the Medusa sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> It's a really cool dungeon. Althea's just not okay. a good Dark Lord. No, it's, it's, cool, a, it's cool. a great dungeon, and she's creepy as heck. It's just, she's a monster who lives in the dungeon. She's not a good Dark Lord. She's, she's a she's great final lord. Boss. She's dark, but not a dark mm-hmm, lord. Mm-hmm. So, Hades, as we said, has a lot of these great qualities. And the, more than anything, the reason we wanted to crack the sort of high concept, like... None of this is going to matter for the gameplay experience, but we kind of need to figure out a way to make this work for the lore. Mm -hmm. Was we wanted to bring in Hades as a Dark Lord, have this in our our constellation of Disney Dark Lords. So we had a couple of ideas, and this is going to touch on under this all under the umbrella of the Act of Ultimate Darkness Mm -hmm. to kind of have to give his whole story that leads to the Act of Ultimate Darkness. Spoiler alert, it's putting it out on a baby. Yeah. Like our second second putting an assassination contract on a baby. Because we had to get into why he wants to free the Titans. Yes, yes. Like, Hercules, it's fun. It's it's, it's a really fun movie, but it doesn't really get into Hades' motivation. Look at that guy's face. Yeah. He's he's evil, clearly. He's he's clearly evil. His hair is fire. And there, there are a couple of really suggestive, interesting lines, but they never expand on those lines, and right. so that was that was our job, dear listeners. So. so we thought of maybe, like, like how do we do gods? You know, it's such mm. a weird thing to have a god that's a Dark Lord and have gods in Ravenloft, and as these, like, physical beings that just interact. Like, like this is a very standard D&D universe mm-hmm. of the gods, mm-hmm. but that doesn't really fit Ravenloft at all. Yeah. So originally we were even like, maybe, like, they were really powerful wizards, and they were like a family of wizards that live on an extra-dimensional realm in Mount Olym, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then Rachel's like, they can just be gods. Like, and how we kind of squared the circle, we'll explain in a minute. But one of the things that really cracked that they could just be gods is that the only one we really yes. see interacting with anyone is Hades. Yes. It's work. Oh, it's so perfect. That, like, Zeus, he talks to Hercules in the temple. Yes. And he smites Phil with a lightning bolt. Yes. But other, he never leaves Olympus. Yes, no yes, one leaves yes. Olympus. Like, all the gods who live on Olympus stay there. That's all we ever see them. Yeah. Hades, it, who lives in the underworld, he leaves. But none of the other gods leave Olympus. doing stuff in the world all the time, in, mm-hmm. the, in the material plane, so to speak. So that, that's yes. what we needed. So this is our, our concept. We had this world... It was not in Ravenloft. It was just one of the little bubbles in the great ether of the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse floating around. Possibly connected to what's it called? Theros. Theros. Yeah. Possibly yeah. like an iter- a, a multiverse branch of Theros. And it was, as in the opening Gospel Truth song, mm-hmm. it was this world of very much elemental chaos. It was kind of ruled and tormented and suffering under these kind of enormous elemental chaotic titans. And then, then along, along came Zeus. Thunderball. <laughs> so, the gods rose up. If you're going with Theros, it was like people's belief, people's need, or maybe it was just, you know, these extra dimensional entities. These gods from another multiverse came into this one mm-hmm. and they defeated the Titans, they imprisoned them, and Hades is given the job of keeping an eye on them. And that's a departure from the movie. But. What we were talking about those really suggestive lines that hinted up a stronger uh-huh, motivation. Yes. And one that really jumped out at us was when he, he goes up for Hercules' birth and he has the, the line about, well, unlike you gods lounging about up here, I regretfully have a full time job that you, by the way, so charitably bestowed on me, Zeus. Yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting the idea that Hades is the god with a job yes, and he really yes. resents that. That's the most we 
ever get in terms of a motivation other than look at him he's got evil hair he wants to be king because he's a bad guy like like the only thing like a grudge a motivation for overthrowing zeus is that line Mm -hmm. and so we're kind of taking that he was given the job of being in charge of the underworld and mixing it with he was given the job of being the Titan's jailer. Because whoever the Titan's jailer was wasn't going to be able to live on Olympus because they're going to be keeping an eye on the Titans. So they're like, oh, well, if you're the god of the underworld, you're not on Olympus anyway, so we'll just we'll just yeah, give yeah. you both the jobs. And you could just go and have the jobs, and we can be up here and party. And you could already see our element of tragedy. Around yeah, around. right, right. That sucks. And even he had that line, unlike you gods lounging about up here... And we, that thing we mentioned where he's the only one that's interacting on the mortal world, like he almost does seem on a, on a different dimensional plane than the other gods. Mm-hmm. Like he's much more in the mortal world. So this was the key. We're saying that since he was forced to be the jailer, of, to be the sort of lord of the underworld, and in this universe, in this cosmos, the underworld is connected. to It's part of the material plane. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the Underdark. You can go there. There are caves that will take you there. And it kind of is another dimension, but it's also kind of part of this planet. Mm -hmm. So, he has to take on mortal form. That he he still is an incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful being. Like, spoilers for stats. We're giving him the base stats of a pit fiend. Yes, yes. But the other gods are in this celestial realm. They only interact indirectly, like, through talking statues. But he actually sort of in the material plane as a material being. So, basically, he has an avatar. Yes. And none of the other gods do. Yes. And so, since he has this avatar, then you're able to interact with him and have a boss fight with him if that's what you want to do. Yes. And that's what gets us... That can go into Ravenloft. Mm-hmm. That's much less kind of metaphysically problematic than a <laughs> god going into Ravenloft as a Dark Lord. is Oh, an avatar. Mm-hmm. Like the avatar, the manifestation of a god being sent to Ravenloft as a Dark Lord. And that even works great for the Dark Lord plot armor because, you know, if you do kill right. Hades, if you do kill this avatar, it's an avatar. He'll get another one. Yeah, it'll just go to the underworld and he'll regenerate. Mm-hmm. And maybe even way back in their, like, home dimension, they're just chugging along and there's like another Hades and yeah, like it, it yeah. was a weird branching thing where like another Hades rose up mm-hmm. and and they has another avatar whatever but it's this avatar of Hades this material manifestation of Hades is our dark lord we became a dark lord because he put a hit on a baby. Yes. So that back to like this is all part of that same bullet point of <laughs> act of all the darkness. He has the same thing in movie Hades. He wants to overthrow Zeus. He wants to overthrow the Olympians. He wants to rule to take the throne, and to do so, he figures he can unleash the Titans. They have enough power with him on their side. To overthrow Zeus. But even though he's their jailer, he can't just do yeah. that. There has to be all the, like, the mystically proper, right. like, the stars have to be in the right alignment, and the this, and the that. You know yeah. the kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean it even makes sense, the whole, like, he's their jailer, but he didn't make the jail. Yeah, he's just keeping an eye on it. Obviously, they would put all these, like, mystical seals on it. Mm-hmm. So, Hercules is born. And we have in the movie, it's specifically if Hercules fights, Hades will fail. Mm -hmm. Like, in in 18 years, he will unleash the Titans and he will rule Olympus unless Hercules fights. We're tweaking it a little bit and with a prophecy. This is going to be a big thing. We're going to come back to this later. It's Mm -hmm. a very important part of the setting. That in this version, there's two prophecies. And one is if a a true hero will stop him. If a true hero opposes him, a true hero will stop him. Because otherwise Hercules isn't going to be your only possible piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this this even, like, gives you some space if you don't need to, like, yeah, Hercules, we're here to cheer for you. <laughs> I'm going to give your you, luggage. I'm going to give you advantage on a roll. <laughs> oh, boy, I helped. Mm-hmm. No, it's like there's enough wiggle room. It's one of those, you know, a, a proper prophecy has a lot of wiggle room. Mm-hmm. And it could end up that your PCs are the true heroes. Yeah. Or one of them is the true hero. Mm-hmm. But then when Hercules was born there was this prophecy that Hercules has the potential to be a true hero. Mm -hmm. So he put two and two together and made four and didn't just make four in terms of what it added up to, made four in terms of he made four happen. Yeah. He took a two and he took a two and he decided to put that plus sign there. And that is an excellent transition Mm -hmm. into our torment. So our torment is, and this is, I like this a lot. This is another big part of like cracking this Mm -hmm. setting. I'll talk about more in a minute. But the torment is... 
it is a Greek tragedy. Yeah. He is doomed to fail, and all of the actions he takes to prevent that fate may, are what make it happen. Mm-hmm. So I was just watching a video talking about the Oedipus Rex, and it's the whole Oedipus' parents had a prophecy of this dark future, so they abandoned him in the woods, so he was adopted... Then there was a prophecy that he would kill his father, so his adopted father kicked him out, so he ran into his biological father, and they got into a fight, and like, mm-hmm. no, all, these, all of the actions Oedipus's various parental figures took to prevent this dark prophecy from and happening his wife. are what made the dark prophecy happen, yeah. and that's what's happening here. You know, if you think about it, we were talking about this with the we watched Hercules, talking about it with our kids, this kind of is baby's first Greek tragedy, that yeah. if... Hades had left Hercules alone, Hercules might not have beaten him. Mm -hmm. Hercules might have just been lounging around on Mount Olympus and never become this great, like, hero god. Yeah. And it definitely, if he hadn't done all the stuff with Meg, Hercules wouldn't have had that, like, personal grudge against him. Like, his actions put Hercules in the exact right place to defeat him Mm -hmm. and overthrow his plan. So that is, our torment is basically not only... Will he never win? Like that's that's pretty basic. That's pretty mm-hmm. Bush League's torment. Like, yeah, that's that's every dark. That's word. every dark word. He'll never win. He'll never take the throne. Blah 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 blah. But no, the delicious twist, mm-hmm. the real sting in the tail here, is that not only will he never win, he will lose because of the actions he took. Like, yeah, the stuff he does to try and win will be what leads to his downfall. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty good. That's, that's that's pretty delicious. And he's just constantly, every prophecy he can find, he's mm-hmm. digging up because this is the one. This is the one that he'll be able to use to win. It's not the one he'll be able to use no. to win. And then, element of tragedy and relatability here, it's just right here. I mean, doesn't that suck? <laughs> like, the reason Greek tragedy, the reason a play like Oedipus Rex still speaks to us is we all feel the deep empathy for that sort of faded failure Mm -hmm. and especially for that faded failure where like you are the author of your own destruction where your tragic flaw will lead to a tragic downfall because you tried to stop that tragic downfall from happening because aren't we all the authors of our own destruction aren't we all at the end of the day the authors of our own destruction (laughs) And, you know, even just can't we all, we've all felt like we're fated to fail. We've mm-hmm. all felt like it doesn't matter what we do or what steps we take. The deck's just stacked against us. The yeah. game's rigged. Yeah, to quote another uh, Hades-based mm-hmm. uh, piece of media, the ones who load the dice always say the game is fair. Yeah, yeah. Keep a pin in that. Mm-hmm. Keep a pin in that. Keep a that. And then finally... This was really something Rachel picked up. With that line, we're going to come back to a lot. It's really one of our critical lines mm-hmm. for this whole, as a character. Hades has a very smart kid who has to do all the work in the group project. Vibe. Yeah, that was really just... Again, there's there's not much in the way of element of tragedy or relatability yeah. to Hades. But when he had that line... Yeah. Like, and it might be that we watched it when I was reading Dragonlance. <laughs> but I, I, he said that line, and like suddenly he turned into Raceland. And what I'm up? like, oh, okay. Mark your color generational nerd <laughs> reference, bingo card. <laughs> But, like, that's the one moment, I think, where Hades is a relatable mm-hmm. and kind of sympathetic fit character. He's pretty. He's a pretty big jerk uh-huh. for the whole movie. But, like, Zeus makes some dumb joke and everybody's laughing. And he has that line about, you're all lounging around here and I have a job. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, wow, that sucks to be you. Like, yeah, it does That's sucks. rough, buddy. And even, like, you get, you know, Zeus makes a joke and everyone starts laughing. And it... It's kind of like what we were talking about with Scar, with sort of the perception of how life was when you were in high right. school. Not necessarily the reality. Right, we've, right. We've grown enough that we can look back and say this wasn't how it really was. <laughs> but, like, we totally felt in high school, like, you know, the jocks were just sitting on top of everything, yeah, laughing yeah. their heads off, while we sat around and were miserable and had an actual job, like, toiling to, to, to like, get our good grades, and yeah. possibly doing their group projects for them. <laughs> and if you're listening to this podcast, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. feel like there's a decent chance you at least one time did all the work in a group project. Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, once it, now we're adults and we can look back and do we know everyone... Everyone in high school was was in their own personal hell, much like a dark uh-huh, lord. Uh-huh, yes, yes. But at the and time... And was like a dark lord, the author of their own yes. misery. Yes. But at the time, we felt like Hades and the captain of the football team was used. Yes. And there's... That's... That's element of relatability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, even, like, when we had this idea of Zeus giving him 
the role of being the Titan's jailer, being mm-hmm. the, you know, the king of the underworld. Like, he wouldn't have given him that job if he didn't think he could handle yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So once again, it's like, it's that nerd thing of you're being punished and given extra yes, work yes. for doing a good job. Yes. And once again, this is a lot of reading between the lines. Mm-hmm. None of this is explicitly spelled out in the movie. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's just, you know, 100% us personal bringing our personal... Yeah. yeah. But it, it feels like that's there... And it's our job to find elements right, of tragedy, right. relatability in Hades. And that line, yeah, it gives it gives you a lot to work with. I get just an impression that in a lot of the Hades fandom, there's a very similar conclusion. So mm-hmm. Like, it's very easy for basically that one exchange. Yeah. So that's, it's clearly not just us that's saying that one, ex- that exchange is where you get that element of, like, tragedy and relatability. And if you ever wanted to be like, hashtag Hades did nothing wrong, <laughs> then, like, that's the scene that always gets brought mm-hmm. back to. It's mm-hmm. always looped back to is that scene on Olympus. So our final element is the domain reflecting the Dark Lord's personality or curse and, you know, it's ancient Greece, so they're done. Mm-hmm. Check. No, no. <laughs> this was the key because we were talking, we're trying to figure this out. It's a great D&D setting. He's a great Dark Lord, but the real, I think, breakthrough to saying, okay, we figured this out as a domain. We found the horror. We found the horror. Because how is this a horror setting? It's a Hydra. Mm. It's a Medusa. The monsters are real scary. The monsters are Greek monsters. And oh. there's a... Good stuff, yeah. All of us had at least one Greek myth that gave us nightmares as yeah, kids. I, yeah. feel, I feel confident saying. And that was... We were talking to our kids, as I mentioned, using this as the example of explaining Greek tragedy, baby's first Greek tragedy. I like that it's kind of subtly there. It's, like, not commented on that Hercules never like, you did this, Hades, because you tried. Like, <laughs> it's there for you to pick up that this is a Greek tragedy. And uh, we realized the whole, that's got to be the horror of the domain, and that's how it reflects the Dark Lord, is the domain of tragic fate. Mm-hmm. And this is very much bringing in that Greek fate tragedy idea. This is the domain of fate, and everyone has their fate, and there's nothing you can do about yeah. it. Like, as soon as you enter this realm, or you're either born into it, or you come in through the mist, you have a fate. Mm-hmm. And that fate is inevitable, and nothing you can do can avoid that fate, and indeed, all of the actions you take will make that fate happen. Mm -hmm. And most people, it's very simply just you're fated to work and die and then be just floating around the underworld and (laughs) life's actually pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. But you do have heroes, which we're going to get back to in a little bit, and those can be your PCs, and the whole they have, they are a tragic fate. Every hero in this world is a tragic hero. Yeah. And every hero here will have their downfall, their tragic Mm -hmm. downfall. And the great thing is, because that's like at sort of, Going to be tricky for the DM to be like, okay, I guess you need to come up with a tragic fate. But you have that wonderful idea of the tragic flaw. Mm-hmm. And in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, there's a specific part of your character mm-hmm. sheet that says flaw. And even, like, if you have the right party, then your PCs are going to salivate yeah, at yeah. this. Like, <laughs> we've, we've mentioned before that my, my players are Tom and our occasional co-host, yeah, Chris yeah. Newton. And I'm sure Tom already knows it. I know what his tragic flaw is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is pretty obvious. And I'm sure Chris right now has giant hard eyes. He's like, I know exactly how this would go. I know exactly <laughs> what that tragic downfall would be. So if you've got the right group, yes. your players are going to do all your work for you. Yeah, they will. Yeah. So, but this did is in this domain... It all generates out from Hades. Hades is a character trap in a Greek tragedy. Mm-hmm. And his arrogance will always lead to his downfall. And his, like, just believing he can game the system mm-hmm. will always lead to the system winning. Mm-hmm. And everyone in this domain, every hero who comes in has that. As soon as you come into this realm, this domain, your flaw on your character sheet becomes your tragic flaw that leads to your downfall. Yeah. And if you're a GM, I bet right now you're thinking about some of your PCs and mm-hmm. you're thinking about some of their flaws and mm-hmm. you're thinking, oh, I know exactly what to do. I do with this. You're total inability to resist a pretty face. Yeah. You're, like just that. Yeah. That's so, it's so good. It's all mm-hmm. right there. And it, and it is making them a character in the kind of story that this realm is all about. Yeah. yeah. And that's pretty cool, I think. It and is once cool. Again, yeah. That was the, that, and, and not just... A story specifically, a horror story. Mm-hmm. And a very terrifying to think. You know, this is the whole point of the Final Destination series. Yeah, idea yeah. That, like, no, your downfall is inevitable. Mm-hmm. And the things you do to try and prevent it are the things that lead to it happening. So, Hades, it's not just that he's it's Greek. He's Greek, the end. It's that, no, even the, like, 
metaphysics of this universe are all radiating out. And they're all reflecting Mm -hmm. him. And every hero that comes in will stop his plans because that's part of his tragic flaw. Like, Mm -hmm. that's the point. That's why they're there. That's why the Dark Powers brought them there. (laughs) But then they will have their own tragic flaw. And we realize also with the kind of the metaphysic of this that it's all tied into Zeus trapping the Titans that they were chaos, mm-hmm. but chaos also leads to choice. We yeah. just finished watching Loki season two. Boom, and, boom, you boom, know, boom. <laughs> that, in advance, folks. <laughs> that's that's what it's all about. Right. So, like, yeah, the Titans are gone. We don't have the primordial chaos. We have order. We have the sacred timeline. Yes. But that means you can't become a variant. You're stuck. Right. And guess what? In Olympus, the sacred timeline ends with your tragic downfall. Yes, yes. That you have the primordial chaos has been harnessed, but the dark side of that is the loom of fate is inviolable. That mm-hmm. like the that it's also a motivation. If you wanted to give even a more sympathetic motivation to Hades, it's not just I'm going to unleash the Titans to overthrow, to take the throne, to take Olympus. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to unleash the Titans because that'll kind of bring freedom back. Like mm-hmm. that'll that'll break the loom of fate. Yeah, and that'll actually give kind of people the power to choose their own destinies. But it won't, cause he won't, but cause won't, he's won't. a duck lord. <laughs> <laughs> and like we were talking about with Shere Khan last month, that's what he says yes, is his yes. motivation. You can even see that's what he believes yes. is his motivation. It's not his motivation. No. <laughs> Motivation is to show all those smug football player jerks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So speaking of our our very honestly very quite Loki adjacent in this iteration of him, yeah, snarky loser, uh, <laughs> Dark Lord. We have, as we said, Rachel said, we are using for the the stats the pit fiend, the idea that he has stats similar to a pit fiend because that's very very powerful. Very powerful spellcaster, a lot of fire spells. Mm-hmm. Of course, he's also going to have a lot of necromancy. Mm-hmm. Like, he's going to be this incredibly powerful, like a level 20 necromancer, yeah. because he's the lord of the undead. He's mm-hmm. the lord of the dead, which makes him the lord of the undead. We are also imagining a certain special powers connected with his domain things. And this is another thing that's very unique about this version of Hades. Yeah. In the Disney movie, is he such a wheeler dealer? Mm-hmm. He's such a like used car salesman, Mephistophelian figure yeah. that he's all about sort of the manipulating and making deals and making bad deals. Mm-hmm. So we're imagining like Doctor Facilier, all about the deals. There's a similar power that if he makes a deal with you, then he can cast any spell, any spell from any spell list to fulfill that contract. Mm-hmm. And you don't get a saving throw. Yeah. But the contract is then a supernaturally binding thing. It's kind of a mutual gesh. Mm-hmm. That you know what? As we saw, and this is one of the really like well plotted things about this yeah. movie. He is as bound by the contracts mm-hmm. as Hercules is. Yeah. So that's PCs love that kind of mm-hmm. find the loophole and manipulate the yeah. jerk guy into breaking it, and manipulate Asmodeus into breaking it. And Hades is as bound by these contracts as any PC or NPC he makes the contract mm-hmm. with. So if he says, I uh, okay, part of the deal is no harm will come to Meg, and Meg gets smushed by a pillar, then contract's out. Yeah. Broke. That's kind of one of the ways that we are that we can differentiate him from Dr. Facilier, yes. is he's much more getting tied up in the legalese. Yes, yes, yes. And obviously he has mooks, he's got his demons, his little imps, pain and panic, and it completely makes sense he could have all sorts of undead. Mm-hmm. He could be sicking all sorts of like zombies and whites and revenants on people. He could have all sorts of like weird contracts with people's souls that let him like sort of Billy Butcherson style. He can like <laughs> raise them up as zombies to go do his will mm-hmm. if he if they sold their souls to him. He's got Meg. He could have more people like Meg. You yes. know, if you want, you, you could have it be that there's an Electo and a Tisiphone there. Even the idea taking from Meg, they're, they're playing in that very Faust infernalist like there could be cults of Hades there could be mm. kind of bringing in a lot of the stuff in the, your classical Dungeons and Dragons infernalist Asmodeus cults there could be like cults of people that sold their soul to Hades for power yeah. and sort of you know worship him and do his will mm-hmm. so very easy to have sinister cults of, of Meg's S figures and then you had you know that she was the the centaur I don't remember her name Jim yeah. Cummings <laughs> <laughs> Nessus I think Nessus yeah that she was you know she was trying to recruit Nessus 
that like there is the Hydra that you know in the movie is kind of like Hades is mm -hmm. the one running the Hydra. There's a bit where he there's a boar. He sends a boar against it as mm -hmm. he's recruited this boar monster and he sends it against Hercules. And so you can have the idea that like either because they want to ride Hades coattails to power. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, again, kind of going off that idea of he has this, you know, sunnier version of freeing the Titans. Yeah, yeah. That maybe he can sell them on. So he's he's got a lot of moves. He's, you can have any number of villains who are working for Hades. Oh, this is a full, like, Cobra Commander, Rita Repulsa-esque. Like, he could have so many different minions, <laughs> monsters, weirdos, snake-shaped tanks that he's sending at you. What Greek mythology monster is Goldar? <laughs> and then we're going to have this. It's not really a power and dominion, but it is a feature of his Dark Lordness of the whole. The actions he take will inevitably lead to his plans failing. Mm -hmm. He has this. He's fated to lose. He is fated to fail to free the Titans or overthrow the Olympians. And not just to fail because, oh, no, they tripped. Like, oh, no, I had an <laughs> aneurysm and fell off Reichenbach Falls. <laughs> But, like, no, the step, the stuff he did mm -hmm. will lead to his downfall. Yeah. And then finally, of course, the power all Dark Lords have, except Prince John and a little bit Shere Khan, <laughs> and that is closing the borders. And we are imagining that it's, you know, this is Greece, so it's islands. And you have some very big mm -hmm. islands, like the, the place, they don't do a lot of sailing around. They really only go to Phil's Island, and then it's kind of on one big landmass. But it is islands, and they're sort of a, you know, ocean surrounding all the land masses. And the seas become stormy. Mm -hmm. So, like, to go into this domain, you're kind of always going on water. You're always taking a boat. The borders of this domain are ocean. And you come into this domain, and if Hades wants to close the borders, then it's just the seas are too stormy to get past that. And we even see that in the movie. Yeah, yeah. With Phil, Phil's try like, the Titans have been unleashed. Phil's leaving. It's the darkest, the always lost moment, the <laughs> darkest hour, and the seas are really, really stormy. And just that, that's that. And that's he's closing the borders. So the last thing for talk about Hades, though I'm sure we'll come back to him again because mm -hmm. really we're all here for Hades. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're here for Hades, right? You're right. like, oh, what's Hercules going to be? I know you were here for Hades. There's that stretch of the movie yeah. where it's just Hercules and Phil. Like, Hades is in the beginning, and then he's gone for 20 minutes that feel like 20 hours. Yeah, yeah. And then Meg shows up, and you're like, oh boy, Yay! Meg's here. This is a scene without without Hades or Meg that I'm not really interested. <laughs> but that is in the Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft style. We need our role-playing trait, our ideal bond and flaw. And in that Van Richten's Guide, there are always quotes. So we always try and find our quotes that express us about the character. So we are going to do what we do in the last couple of sessions. Uh, this was a tricky one. Once again, mm. Tom is the one who has found the quote because, dear listeners, at this point in time, I am still up to my eyeballs in sarcophagi with skeletons doing who even doing, knows what. Doing stuff. Doing, <laughs> enjoying Beetlejuice the musical. Um, so, <laughs> so that, dating, yeah, fun dating. And uh, you have listened to this by now, I hope. If not, you should I go sure and do hope to so. It's I, really long and really it, funny. I, I promise Flippity it's funny. hope it's up by now. Like, promise it's worth it. It's really funny. We're super drunk. Make a lot of make a lot of jokes. Not appropriate for work. Mm. So that's not on us. That's on the book. So, that is on the book. That is on the book. I found some quotes, and it's not like with with some people, there are multiple songs they sing. This it's just this guy really likes to talk. He does, and I know in some of the making of stuff they said that you know James Wood would just like go off. Like a lot of this was improv, and mm. a lot of this was like there were just hours and hours of unused audio because he would just like go off. It's just like if we had genius, a dark one. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a lot of audio, a lot of potential, and I found some quotes that feel very relevant to the heart of his character to his role-playing trade ideal bomb and flaw. So I'm going to run them by you and we'll figure out what we want to do for our official role-playing trade ideal bomb and flaw. Okay. This is one you probably expected was coming as we kind of told you it was coming. Mm -hmm. And I said, get it right out front. Love to, babe. But unlike you gods lounging about up here, I regretfully have a full-time job that you, by the way, so charitably bestowed on me. Zeus, so can't. Love to, but can't. Feels like something. But... Feels like something. Is it going to be his ideal? Is it going to be his flaw? Is it going to be... But that, 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 That's yeah, something. Yeah. That's on the sheet. Might be know. his bond. Might be his bond, actually, yeah. Meg, 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 my sweet, deluded little minion. Aren't we forgetting one teensy-weensy, but ever so crucial little tiny detail? I own you. Mm -hmm. I'm the monster. Million fanfics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But, uh... Million <laughs> fan fiction, at least one novel. Yeah. Because you can't copyright. Yeah, right. And- mm-hmm. In fact, we are quite mm-hmm. pleased with, in terms of this being one of the ones that we can just share willy-nilly and not have to worry about any Disney nonsense. I, I-, I know which one this is. I think I think okay. so. He's got to have a weakness, because everybody's got a weakness. I mean, for Pandora, it was the box thing. For the Trojans, hey, they bet on the wrong course, okay? Everybody's got... Yeah, that's that's, that's the ideal. That's the ideal. That's yeah. the ideal. He's got to have a weakness because everybody's got a weakness. I was thinking maybe the flux is the cynicism, but, like, mm-hmm. that's his ideal is I can find. Like, like everyone has a weakness, and, of course, the unspoken second point is I'll find the weakness. Yeah. I'll find the weakness. I'll exploit the weakness. So, mm-hmm. the ideal... He's got to have a weakness because... Yeah. No, I mean... And th- this was... I. I like this a lot. I wish it wasn't conditional. Mm-hmm. The part of the conversation when when he's saying, you know, I'll let Meg live, I'll let Meg go to Hercules if you give up your your divine power for 24 hours. And Hercules says, will people get hurt? And he says, no, nah, I mean, you know, it's a possibility. It happens because, you know, it's war. But what can I tell you? Anyway, what do you owe these people, huh? Mm-hmm. And just, I love that, like, no. I mean, it's a possibility. I mean, yes. Uh-huh. But, what, but what do you owe, but what do you owe these people anyway? uh-huh. it's like maybe there's something where with anyway what do you owe these people huh mm-hmm. but I'm not sure it is so conditional on that like Hercules saying will people get hurt mm-hmm. and then this was actually I didn't know this until I was doing the research here this is actually a post credits the very end of the credits we get a little bit of her Hades dialogue what do you say it's happy ending time everybody's got a little taste of something but me I got nothing I'm here I'm here with nothing anybody listening <laughs> so there's something there for everybody's got a little taste of something but me. Yeah. And I got nothing. I'm here with nothing. Anybody listening? Like, I'm here with nothing. That might be everybody's got a little taste of something but me. I'm going to put a pin in that as a possibility for flaw because yeah. it speaks to the envy. The envy and the resentment mm-hmm. and the I'm, the I'm the one doing all the... And, like, we're imagining he's a dark lord. Just to be clear. He's a dark lord. He's a selfish jerk. The other gods are working. Mm-hmm. It's like, I did all the work on the group project except the research and the pictures and the putting the <laughs> PowerPoint together and the presenting it because I don't like to talk. Like, But all the work I did, like, that's this guy. Mm-hmm. That's this. He's mm-hmm. not the, actually the one that did all the work on the group project. He just feels, he believes yes. he did. Yes. And that's why we feel for him, but he's not right. Yeah. Because he's a dark war, which means he's a selfish jerk. Mm-hmm. So you very much could have the everybody get a little taste of something but me. We were so close, so close, and we tripped at the finish line. Mm. And that's a potential there for that, like, fate. We were so close, we tripped at the finish line. And then this, how we got out, these two, these two I think are real strong. Which is he takes away Hercules' strength, he knocks him around, and he says, now you know how it feels to be like everyone else. Isn't it just peachy? Ooh. And then same thing. So that scene, that scene's very useful for us. Mm-hmm. And that scene, well, got a blaze. I have a whole cosmos up there waiting for me with, hey, my name on it. And that feels very ideal to me. I've got a whole cosmos waiting or maybe Bond or just like something there. Well, that's mm-hmm. him saying that I want to conquer. I want to rule the universe. I had a blaze. I have a whole cosmos up there waiting for me with, hey, my name on it. Maybe that could be the ideal. Right. The whole quote with the everybody's got a weakness could be the trait. Because I feel that yeah. be a voice that's a very useful. Yes. That would yes. be really useful. For, okay. As the GM, how do I play this? Yes, guy? yes, yes. And it's he's looking for your weakness. And, and he's kind of a motor mouth. Yeah, and, motor yeah. mouth thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, I love that. Yes. And even that's exactly how we would approach the PCs, right? Mm-hmm. Like he would not just be. Zappity zappy occult necrotic fire. Uh huh. Like the first thing he would do, his go to move would be like, What's your weakness? Mm-hmm. Everybody, and I know you have one because everybody's got a weakness. Mm-hmm. So we still need a bomb and a flaw. One of them's got to be the full time job thing. Uh huh. Um, I think Bond is a strong. Yeah. A, Bond is a strong one. So I'm cool with Bond for that. Because that's, that's the main point where he mentions Zeus. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like his Bond is that to relationship Zeus to his Zeus, resentment. Yeah. Yeah. And that's bringing his Zeus and his resentment into the same thing. So then we have the flaw. And the flaw... We were so close and we tripped at the finish line. Like, that's kind of the flaw that reality is imposing. Right, him, yeah. It's not his personal Right, what is, what is the thing about his person? It has to be his arrogance. Mm-hmm. His arrogance is his tragic flaws. Arrogance is what leads to his downfall. His kind of over thinking, oh, supplemental material. Yeah. Okay, after a short break to <laughs> consult various quotes, because 
The flaw is he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Musical theater, you're good to come up again. Your Tony Awards. <laughs> so, he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. He thinks he can outthink everyone else. Mm-hmm. He thinks he can, like, manipulate everyone else. And that's really clear in the movie, but a lot of the scenes are very conditional. A lot yeah. of the, like, you have to kind of have the whole scene yeah. to get that. So it's so like, this is an embarrassment of riches. He has yeah. so many quotes, but, like, no, it's none of his quotes express this. It's the way that his actions affect right. the world that shows or his delivery yes. or the, the scenario, like the conversation, the whole scene where he's making the deal with Hercules. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a good one. But like that, we would need the whole scene, not yeah, a, yeah. a quote. So then Rachel nailed it, and this is the scene where he's trying to get Meg to sort of betray Hercules. Uh, I've got a feeling you're going to leap at my new offer. So mm-hmm. that that's our flaw because it's the whole he thinks of himself as this master manipulator, this consummate deal maker, this I will always kind of outthink the person I'm dealing with and I'll always, every deal I'll make, I'll come up on the better side of it. So he only has one button to push. Yeah, yeah. And it's so that he wants to make all these deals and he's not as good at making these deals as he thinks he is. Yes, he can be himself manipulated. And that's part of that really important, like, this is a binding gash on him as well. So we've talked about Hades and with pausing, with the magic of editing, <laughs> we found some good quotes that we think were express you, f- his... you found wonderful quotes honey I Thank don't, you. I don't, that's a tricky one yeah. yeah it's I, I don't i don't want it to be no, like you know you looked for these quotes and it was all in vain like you found wonderful quotes just, it's, no it's, it's, it's real movie. tricky yeah. yeah but as we said that core character he's locked into this tragic fate he's the author of his own destruction and that radiates out from him and that is defining the whole domain and the horror of the domain and we'll talk more about the domain in a section we like to call the land The land. Olympus comprises a warm, mountainous mainland and countless islands, some housing entire city-states, others mysterious havens for monsters and worse. These monsters are as likely to owe Hades a favor as any mortal, and he frequently summons them to populated areas in order to flush out heroes. The people's jaded reaction to Bellerophon, the young man on the flying horse, turned out to be entirely representative of the overall attitude toward heroes in Olympus. They come and go like the tides, and the going is often a great and tragic spectacle. The clerics chalk it up to the cruelty and inexorability of fate, but it may simply be poor luck. As one woman told me, why should we care if a new hero comes? If we're lucky, he'll accidentally kill himself with his own weapons like Perseus. If we aren't, his broken promises will kill everyone he loves along with him, like Jason. The best thing we can do for ourselves is stay away. Staying away appears easier said than done, for the people of Olympus seem drawn to doom and tragedy like moths to flame, perhaps because of the dreadful fate of which the clerics spoke. No matter how much that woman claimed to despise heroes, her eyes constantly danced back to pictures of Bellerophon. I wondered how long it would be before Megara became one of the ill-fated loved ones she disdained. If and when that fate befalls her, Bellerophon will not be the cause. Before I left, Someone gave him the idea that he was already a true hero and could climb Mount Olympus without an invitation from the gods. No one knew exactly what would happen to him, only that he would never be seen again. So that brings us to the land. We said we really wanted to do this because Hades is such a great dark horse, such a great character, but honestly, almost as much we want to do this because this is a fantastic potential setting for D D adventures and we hope we can we can pitch you ravenloft adventure specifically because there isn't a ancient greece ravenloft domain yeah like, like spo- spoilers for strength for unfilled niches. yeah yeah like yeah <laughs> i i have a whole thing i could go in about how like ancient greece is this great unfulfilled D D space and like there is theros right now and we're going to mention Theros again, as we said. <laughs> Get used to hearing Theros. But, like, I got the Theros guidebook, and I, like, don't play magic. I knew nothing about it as a magic setting. I don't care anything about it as a magic setting. I just wanted an ancient Greece setting. Mm-hmm. Because it is, I think, a real perfect fit for D&D. 
and it was really unfilled thick. The so. Argonauts are a party. Yeah, they go yeah. around <laughs> doing quests and slaying monsters. Right, you've got monsters, <laughs> you've got gods, you've got magic stuff, you've got labyrinths, you've got like a pantheon that the average nerd is going to be have some familiarity with. You've got mm-hmm. a big cultural hook with younger people because of the Percy Jackson stuff. I was supervising a D&D camp uh, the past summer when we recorded this, and one of the kids was flipping through the player's handbook and got really, really excited to see the Greek gods mm-hmm. as potential deities because he was, and he was wearing like a camp half blood shirt. Aww. Like, and he was so excited Adorable. at kind of mixing Percy Jackson and D&D <laughs> and this game he's enjoying. So just, it's a huge unfulfilled niche in general that Theros like sort of gives you for 5e, for like standard D&D, but that also means it's, unfulfilled for Ravenloft. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we can do that. Yes. But enough talking about why this is great and why we're really smart. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the smart, great thing that we made, that these smart, great people made. <laughs> so as we mentioned at the top, we are calling the domain Olympus, just for ease of, of rec- it should be Hellas. Yes, I know. Don't add us. <laughs> That would be better, but people wouldn't necessarily know what it was if they saw the cover on the DMs Guild. One of us has man confidence. You'll never guess which one of us has man confidence. (laughs) And uh, we're imagining just proper Greek style. It's an island chain surrounded by water. We are imagining the sort of central, there's like the sort of central largest landmass island. And the center of that is Mount Olympus. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it makes sense, like, symbolically. It's it's the axis mundi, it's the center of the cosmos, it's the the radial of the world. And so, Mount Olympus, it's there, and before they went into Ravenloft, it was this kind of bridge between the material plane and the celestial realm. There's kind of the celestial Mount Olympus. You know, the the movie does a good job expressing this. It's like... They're up there, and it's like this—the clouds, and then there's even like Hercules can't just like walk up the mountain before he achieves his true greatness, becomes he becomes a true hero. And when he does, there is this sort of like golden gates opening and like rainbow mm-hmm. light. And so you no, this is like you're ascending to a celestial realm, and the mountain's the bridge. It's like you know to to talk about another thing that a character from Greek mythology showed mm-hmm. up, and it's like how Odysseus almost just sailed to Mount Purgatory. Right, yeah. Like, he saw it right there, but you don't just get to sail to Mount Purgatory and climb it. Yeah, it's yeah, a- yeah. It's that physical kind of echo of this divine realm. Now, as we mentioned, one that got pulled into Ravenloft, the other gods were basically cut off, and Mount Olympus too. So it's like, it's still there. You can still see Mount Olympus. But it's not clear if that, like, is still the original Mount Olympus, if it is still that bridge between the divine realm and the mortal realm. Mm-hmm. Or if it's just, like, sort of a mirage, of, or it's just a mountain now. Like, you actually could just go to the top and it'd be a really tall mountain. And yeah, if your PCs do try to go on Mount Olympus, then you definitely have the potential to do some creepy horror stuff. Yeah, because yeah. Because, like, you know, if the actual Greek gods aren't there anymore then who is? Mm -hmm. Like, the the dark powers are going to put something there Uh to kind of be, like, toying with the expectations of your PCs. And maybe they're just going to be, like, versions of the gods that are just mockeries created Mm -hmm. by the dark powers. Maybe it's going to be, like, some shadow version of the gods that is sort of, like, their, their worst selves. But you definitely have the potential for there being some kind of, like, uh-huh. dark echo of Olympus that... That'd be so cool. Yeah. That'd be so cool. That'd be so cool. That's a good horror setting. <laughs> horror Mount Olympus. Or you, you could have, like, they attempt to climb and it is just some sort of... Sisyphusian nightmare. <laughs> Sisyphian? I, 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 I don't... <laughs> my, my, One of those, my, attempt, my, right. my attempt to say it is Sisyphus, Sisyphusian. <laughs> um, but just trying to climb it is just this... Yeah, yeah. yeah that they're always almost to the top. Ooh, that's cool. This just... Well, it's like a mirage, almost. And mm-hmm. No matter how far they walk through the desert, they're not going to get to the the oasis. And the mm-hmm. same thing here. They're, they're always just a little ways away Ooh, from scaling really the top. I really love that. I love that. Just go that. a little further. I just like climb for, you know, and you're like, oh, we're about an hour away from climbing to the top. And then climb mm-hmm. another hour. And like, oh, looks like we're about another hour. Oh, I really like that a lot. That's cool. <laughs> it, as we mentioned up top, sort of the, that we're leaving deliberately vague the status of the other gods. Mm-hmm. That maybe, like, they're definitely more distant. Hades is the only one that, and what's fortunately for us in the movie as well as in our setting, 
Hades is the only one that really interacts with the mortal world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, we know in the movie they're clearly like Darren and being involved in the mortal world. But here it's like, yeah, there are oracles and you can get like visions and signs in the temples. But me, and maybe that's like an echo of the gods reaching into Ravenloft. And maybe it's just nothing. Maybe it's the Dark Powers mockery. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's even just like the seer, you know, a, a someone that has a natural magical ability to foresee the future, who is believes they're getting message from the gods. They're just doing divination magic. So that's our sort of general geography. And then in terms of general cultural stuff, you've got all your basic ancient Greek stuff. But one thing that, once again, we really liked about the setting of the movie that dovetails with D&D &D very well is this idea that in this this world, this world of the animated movie Hercules, we have this hero. And hero wasn't just a way of describing a particularly brave or strong or noble person. It's like a career. Mm -hmm. That you've got, like, Phil's job, his calling is to train heroes. And the people of Thebes, you know, talk about different heroes and buy merchandise and pump up sandals. <laughs> Air Herc, pump up sandals. And so it's stupid. It's, so it's a bad joke, oh lord. But for heroes, that this is a major part of the culture, major part of the world, a hero is a profession you undertake. And then you go out and you, like, help people and you fight monsters and you write wrong. Hey, that sounds really familiar. Is this the equivalent? Yeah, it is, yes. I think you're reaching. I don't know. So, yeah, this is perfect for the idea that, like, it, one of the things I love about your average, like, Forgotten Realms D&D &D world is that adventurer is just, like, a career. Yeah. <laughs> you just have, like, I want to go be an adventurer. When I grow up, I want to be an adventurer. My uncle was an adventurer. <laughs> like, yeah, my mom was an adventurer and then, you know, got a big score and bought the tavern and settled mm -hmm. down or whatever. Like, that's just a thing you do. You put it on your resume. <laughs> adventurer <laughs> this year to this year. And then she got a sweet sapphic romance written about Yeah, her. yeah, in her sure. coffee shop. Coffee yeah. shop, yeah. Your PCs come into this world, and they're going to be this this kind of cultural slot they fit into immediately. So everyone's like, oh, you're heroes. Let's see how well you do. <laughs> and like, we're not impressed by you either, because yeah. we see heroes come, heroes go. We mm -hmm. see heroes all the time. And in the movie, the, and in Greek mythology, that a true hero can ascend to godhood, can ascend to Olympus. And once again, we have this wonderful parallel with classic D&D. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the, like, some of the older school stuff, especially, where you hit level 20, you ascend to godhood. <laughs> so we'd have, like, the leveling is like a metric of how far along are you to being a true hero. Mm -hmm. And we're imagining that hasn't happened since they've come into Ravenloft. Yeah. That, like, no hero has hit level 20. And, like, they, they have stories about it. There might even be people that have, like, a very, very, like, dim, you know, the oldest people remember their grandparents talking about this happening. But, man, wouldn't that be a heck of a thing? <laughs> what would that yeah, look right? like in Ravenloft? Oh, man. I didn't, I didn't think about that until just now. Just, what, what? Horrible mockery of that would be. Yes, in yes. That, <laughs> but it hasn't happened. And Hades, we've talked about, has this prophecy that a true hero will overthrow him, will thwart his plan to take Olympus. So he's got his hand in. So you could have this immediate conflict with Hades, which I love. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as your PCs come in, fight monsters, go on quests. Everyone's like, oh look, it's here some more heroes. They're on his radar. Yeah, they're on his radar, and he has a a very compelling setting reason to get directly in their business mm -hmm. so just just i, I love that detail because it does that immediate it's like having a redhead a redhead lady party <laughs> member in your curse of strahd party yeah. it's like you're just getting right to the good stuff you're, mm -hmm. you're getting right skipping a lot of the wind up <laughs> just get right into it and we are imagining that as we said earlier there is this this is the domain of tragic fate yeah. and part of the reason that since they've gone into ravenloft no heroes have gotten a level 20 is because of now this kind of causality cosmic law of tragic fate that anyone who goes on that he all heroes in this world are tragic heroes yeah. and they have a tragic flaw and that tragic flaw doesn't even necessarily lead to their death if i recall correctly oedipus doesn't die at the end of oedipus rex uh but it leads to like some kind of downfall like some kind of like failure or tragedy oedipus wished he died yeah yeah, yeah. Oedipus rex. But like I said, we even have we have some precedent to draw on to say, you know, your PCs aren't doomed. It's not like they're going to go into this domain. Their tragic flaws will kill them, mm -hmm. but will lead to some kind of great tragic downfall or failure. Which, once again, if you've got the right kind of group, yeah, they're, gonna, they're mm. salivating at oh, this right so now. 
<laughs> like, hurt me, hurt me, DM, hurt me. <laughs> and speaking of heroes who are going to bring about Hades' downfall, uh-huh. possibly or possibly not, we have Hercules. Yes. And the whole reason that we did this sort of reskinning thing, saying that the prophecy called for it to be a hero who brings about Hades' downfall, and then also that Hercules has the potential to be a hero, and Hades is the author of his own misfortune, as he always is, is because that way we can have Hercules around without having it be a situation where the PCs are just carrying his luggage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hercules isn't necessarily the main character, Mm -hmm. but he thinks he's the main character, (laughs) and your PCs might go in thinking he's the main character, so if he gets killed, it's going to be a real surprise. (laughs) We always have that dilemma of you've got this character that's the PC. Mm -hmm. Um, Like (laughs) We always kill them. We always kill them. But in this case, we don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Because the great thing is, like, unlike Belle, unlike Basil of Baker Street, we have got this section of the movie where he is the gawky kid. Yeah. Or he is, like, the novice hero. Mm -hmm. Like, we have have a space where the PCs could slot into the story. Mm -hmm. And that means we don't have to kill him, but we certainly could. Because wouldn't it be fun if, like, Hercules is just this gawky kid who hero worships the PCs? Like, imagine that, like, Hercules thinks your PCs are the coolest people ever. That would just be fun. Like, super skinny, and he's, like, knocking stuff around all the time, and he's, like, tripping all the time. Like, very much, like, first 15 minutes of the movie pre-Zero to Hero. Mm -hmm. Hercules, just this gawky kid. And you could totally imagine these, like, experienced monster fighters roll into town. Out, and he's just following them around with puppy dogs. Starry eyed, yeah. Uh, badgering them for tips mm-hmm. and getting in the way when they're try- like trying to help them fight a monster and getting in the way. It'd be so cute. Yeah, yeah. I want one. <laughs> You're running to help you drop your stuff and just mm-hmm, to like, make mm-hmm. everything worse. <laughs> And then feel terrible. It's like, no, it's okay. Uh, This is worth running just for, like, that exchange, that set piece of Hercules ruins your plan and is really sad. (laughs) Really, really, really feels bad about it. Maybe Hades isn't the one who kills Hercules. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then... Also, the great thing is, if you don't want to deal with him at all, it can be, like, a prequel yeah, when yeah. he's, you know, he's not even a cocky kid yet. He's, like, five. Yeah. And so your PCs are former students of Phil's. You know, they're kind of in the Phil's Hall of Heroes. Or Hercules mm. is, is going to check out in 12 years. Yeah. But, you know, hasn't yet. Or you could set it afterwards, and Hercules is already dead. The great thing is, since Hades has this general goal of conquering Olympus... And in the movie, he's got, like, this one specific plan, but it could be sort of a more Saturday morning cartoonish of, like, mm-hmm. he's got a plan now, and to not be Unleash the Titans plan. It's some other plan, and the PCs are the heroes that foil that plan. Because it's like, no, he will always, his plans will always be foiled. Because, as we've kind of picked up in our discussion of all this, the dark powers can actually be very helpful for your PC's dramatic role yeah. of thwarting the, the Dark Lord, because mm-hmm. they want the Dark Lord thwarted. Mm-hmm. So then getting into some of the noteworthy features, some of the specific locations, that sort of wraps our notes on, like, the general ancient Greece Olympus slash Hellas setting. And we have a couple of places we see in the movie, and the great thing is you can also add others. That we have, first off, Thebes, where we spend it. It's kind of dumb. Um, It's kind of just a weird New York, L.A. pastiche. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. It's not great. But, like, it's there. It's in the movie. And it's, I think, very useful for a DM to have because it makes a big city with a big quest hub. Thebes has got all these disasters and volcanoes and earthquakes and fires and monster attacks and crime. And just, it's it's a great place to drop mm-hmm. a bunch of PCs. It's, yeah. like, it's like the setting in like a, an MMO where it's just like the big city full of problems that you're, you can run around and like fight random muggers and stuff. <laughs> and even uh, something I think interesting for this role playing purposes is the idea that this is a population that's kind of jaded when it comes to heroes who has this category of hero the PCs are going to slot into. And once again, a kind of funny scene of, like, the heroes are fighting a monster. There's a bunch of bystanders eating popcorn and, like, critiquing. Yeah, like critiquing like, their form. <laughs> critiquing their form or, like, comparing them to other mm-hmm. monster fighters. Or, like, you've got the one little guy cheering them on. Perseus and... sort of killed it by now. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually going to be fun. 
yeah. and that's that's going to be like a really unique, memorable fight. Is the one where we have you know Statler and Waldorf like offering unsolicited advice, yelling unsolicited advice to us, and criticizing our form. Oh man, I just also realized with uh, with uh, like Hercules merchandising, you could totally also have the fun of like they they win their first battle and then they get approached by people merch, wanting to yeah. do like a merchandising. They want to paint their, them on vases. Like, yeah. Like, can we be like the official provider <laughs> of you know your hero's name brand <laughs> swords? Or yeah, it could be like someone approached them about selling like officially licensed vases with their portrait on it and it was gonna be so much fun for your characters asking for autographs and then later they walk by and they're like selling the stuff that they autographed (laughs) yes and we have phil's island this is really just there to kind of be interact with phil and once again the nice thing here is we've got that that category of hero that's like a, a quest for them to overcome is to like get certified the idea is, you know, thieves, the guard shows up, and they're like, excuse me, are you certified heroes? <laughs> yes, 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 very good, you fought that Hydra, but, like, can we see your ID cards, please? <laughs> so, like, in, in, there's a whole thing in Kingdom Hearts where they go to, like, the, the Hercules, like, stadium land, and it's this whole, they want to be in the games, but you have to be an official hero. Mm-hmm. So then they're going and, like, doing some stuff to get Phil to say they're an official hero. And that give them their hero certification so they can enter the And that could be a whole thing. Like, <laughs> we want to enter the games or we want to do whatever, but we need to get Phil to officially certify us as heroes. And he could send you to missions, tests. If you befriend him, there is a thing in, um, I think, the PHB, and I know the DMG, about doing some, like, training as a downtime activity, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, in the old days, there was much more of how you could train to level up. Mm-hmm. And there still is doing training for certain things to give you little bonuses. And that could, Phil could be a source of that. Like, you actually do have some rules you could adapt for training with Phil. And then he's got, like, a fun, like, Bronze Age danger room. And yes. that's just, that is great. That's just great. You should have at least one, like, encounter where it's Phil makes you go through the danger room. Yes. <laughs> And then, yeah, you can be a quest giver. He knows about, you know, you know, oh, yeah, there's this minotaur. You go, you fight that, you mm. come back and talk to me after you get that done. Bring me one of his horns, and yeah. I'll, I'll consider it. <laughs> so, yeah, there's really, like, the two locations. Hercules, dumb village, no one cares. <laughs> um, make a village have some jerks in it. There you go. <laughs> so those are kind of the canon settings in the movie. But the great thing is, you've got any number of, like, city-states you could put in. You've got... All of ancient Greece. Yes, yes, yes. And they could be an island, and you could have Circe's island, and mm-hmm. you could have Cyclopses, and you could just... Mm-hmm. just you know, there's a good chance some of your players at least remember, like, big, big Odysseus story adventures from as a kid, and, like, some Odyssey mm-hmm. stuff. Or even just, like, in Theros, there's three big cities, and it's basically, like, a- Athens, Sparta, and Thermescria. <laughs> so, like, yeah, do that. Like, yeah. you can have, like, a bunch of Ponzi philosophers, city... And then City of... I hope that's its actual name. (laughs) City of Manly Warrior Ironclad Zack Snyder characters. This is City of Manly Warrior Ironclad Zack Snyder characters. City City of Screaming Jared Butlers. (laughs) And then, like, City of Women, of Fierce Women Warriors. Mm -hmm. Like, the great thing, it's got that wonderful, that sweet spot of it's fun to encounter... But there's like a lot of familiarity, yeah. and until you don't have to explain so much mm-hmm. to your PCs, like when they're yeah. interacting with this society, they like they can make a lot of assumptions about it, know what their whole deal is, and you kind of almost that get that familiarity that's so helpful for just like speeding up interacting with the society, interacting with the NPCs, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, like, what we were just doing back in November with the Great Mouse Detective of, bam, it's London. Yes, It's Victorian London. Great example. You're going to go do Victorian London things. Like, all of that thematic stuff that we were getting with, like, duality and Jekyll and Hyde and this and that, it's kind of there with Radigan. Uh-huh. But so much of that was just stuff that we were pulling out because it's Victorian London and we know that those are the themes people are going to play with. Yeah. And it's it's the same kind of thing here of, like, you drop them in Athens. Uh-huh. It's just like dropping them in London by gas. Like, yes, they know yes, where yes. they are. They know what to do. Yeah, they know how people are going to interact with them. They know, like, sort of what the society expects, what the society values, how the society is going to react to their mm-hmm. behavior. You know, your your barbarian knows if they start smashing things and shrieking and pounding their chest, people go, oh, mm-hmm, yeah, and, like, yeah. be sniffy. Or if your wizard starts declaiming about the philosophy of the multiverse, people gather around and stroke their 
watch it mm-hmm. and go, hmm, ah, oh, very interesting. Let me invite you to my dinner party tonight. Like, if you were doing stuff with the more, uh, like, gothic Victorian settings having more oppression, mm-hmm. they know they're going to be able to come here and be as gay as they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's so helpful, and it's that wonderful, that perfect blend of... It's a new thing. It's fantastic. There's all this new stuff to encounter. It's wondrous. It's fantasy. But it's got all this societal, historical underpinning that then gives them that familiarity that they can know how to role play mm-hmm. and they can know how to interact with the society. Okay, we we'll talk about this all day for here. Okay, yes, just yes, like yes, sort yes. of the, the use of real world cultural analogs. Yeah. Okay. How, how helpful mm. it is. Okay. So we've got, we've mentioned temples. We touched on this a little bit. That we have in in the movie, we just see the one, the Temple of Zeus, but kind of it makes sense logically. There are other temples to other gods in other places, and these are these sacred spots that people go to commune with the gods. And maybe they have legends about in the olden days, the gods would appear on the earth and interact with the world, but now they just commune through their temples. So... I said that we were going to talk about cosmology when we got to Parting Thoughts, but you know what? Let's do it now. We make our own rules, baby. It's <laughs> live. So this is kind of getting into some of the stuff we were talking about with Ezra in the Hunchback of Notre Dame episode, getting into some of the the way that the gods worked differently in Ravenloft than in other settings. Because... There was a sense that since Ravenloft is based more on, like, your Frankenstein and mm-hmm. your Dracula and your other stuff where, like, deities aren't just kind of showing yeah, up. Yeah, right. But there is still divine power. Mm-hmm. Um, like in your Draculas. Like in your Draculas, exactly. So it was the sense that the gods are more subtle here in Ravenloft than they are anywhere else, but there had to be the question of why. Like, mm-hmm. if you're, let's say you've got a cleric of Zeus, and they are regularly talking to Zeus when mm-hmm. they're not in Ravenloft, and then they go into Ravenloft, and suddenly it's this much more, like, obscure communicating with oracles through temples. And they had to come up with kind of a, a cosmological reason for why. The dark powers have sort of shut the gods out, and... There was this sense that maybe the gods are kind of subtly reaching through and able to grant powers, but not like commune with the clerics and whatnot directly. Maybe it is just the dark powers imitating the gods Mm -hmm. and like sort of tempting and luring on the the clerics and the other followers. Maybe it's a little column A, a little column B. You know, maybe there is a real Ezra that is actually Mm -hmm. answering the prayers of the archdeacon, but the thing that's answering for all those prayers is the dark powers Uh because they're trying to lure him down a darker and darker path. Or maybe it's like the power of faith. Mm -hmm. That like a cleric is doing supernatural things, but it's because of the sort of magical power generated by their own faith. Yeah. I know this has come up uh, for those Curse of Straw heads out there. <laughs> uh, you you know there's the Morning Lord. And that's like the big sort of church in Barovia is where the church of the Morning Lord, who is like a sun god. And there's a very strong connection with Lathander. The Morning Lord is Jander Sun Star. Wake up, sheeple. Wake up, sheeple. <laughs> Your god is a glowing elf. <laughs> but... There's this strong connection with Lathander Morning Lord, who is this, like, canon D&D sun god, who, like, you could just be bopping around the Forgotten Realms or whatever and have your cleric of Lathander Morning Lord, and then they get pulled into Curse of the Chance running Curse of Strahd, and suddenly there is this, this church to this deity called the Morning Lord, who seems to be a kind of a sun god, and there might be some overlaps. There's a lot of, like, every couple of months there's the, is the Morning Lord in Barovia Lathander Morning Lord? And the answer is, what do you think? Yeah, so it could be Lathander Morning Lord is able to reach in and, you mm-hmm. know, do stuff subtly. It could be that he's a mockery of the Dark Powers, and is also Jander Sunstar. Um, or it could be that, like, the faith of those clerics mm-hmm. is the thing that's powering their abilities. That, so. like, maybe there was a Church of the Morning Lord worshiping Lathander Morning Lord before Barovia was pulled into Ravenloft, and that, like, that memory is still there, passed down. And then there's an echo of the faith or the whatever or the, like, little remnant of divine. Yeah, so the answer is whatever the GM wants. But the great thing is, as, as much fun as this sort of getting into the metaphysics is going to be yes. for, for, Sorry. T- Sorry. for tormenting your religious PCs, <laughs> right? Which is going to be fun. Like, really give your cleric of Lathander Morning Lord a crisis of a crisis of faith here. Tom got me started on Ravenloft religion. He knew what he was getting into. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. But that even if it is just the sort of oracles and signs, the gods are going to be helping the PCs oppose Hades. Yeah. Because in whatever the gods are, even if they're a mockery by the dark powers, 
they're going to want the PCs to oppose Hades. Yeah. Again, the Dark Powers are weirdly enough on your PC's side mm-hmm. in terms of thwarting the Dark Lord's plan. Yeah. And then finally, we have the Underworld, which once again, in kind of classic Greek mythological form, is Hades' realm. And it is also, it, it is its own world, its own kind of plane, but it overlaps with the material world. So this is, there's there's in Greek mythology, Tenarium or Cape Tenarion, which is like cave system that you could actually go into the underworld. So you could almost imagine this as the, you don't have to like do a plane shift spell or a teleportation spell or something to get there. You can actually can walk to the underworld in this in this cosmos <laughs> and you are entering into a kind of another plane of existence. If you get deep enough into the underworld, kind of like what happens when Hercules jumps in the kind of well of souls, but he walked there. Yeah, yeah. He didn't need a magic thing to get in there. <laughs> so it's almost like a version of the underdark. And but an underdark that's full of undead and less weird spider people. <laughs> and this also, I think, is very useful as a setting because it gives you that classical Greek hero archetype story of the descent to the underworld and return. Mm-hmm. Which once again, only one writing this did I realize. Wow, Disney's like silly Hercules Nike <laughs> sneaker parody Hercules movie kind of also hits that classical beat yeah. of turn of the descent to the underworld and, and, and ascension from the underworld. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty neat of them. Yeah, that's cool. So we hope we've established we have this incredibly cool setting which overlaps with traditional D&D like world and gameplay in a lot of really new but underlyingly familiar ways. But we have this great setting. But, Rachel, what do you do with it? Dread Possibilities I returned to my room in the inn to find the door hanging open, the lock melted into an unrecognizable piece of slag. Sitting at my desk, flipping through my journal, was a tall, pallid man in a black chitin. In place of hair, blue flames wreathed his head. Oh hey, don't mind me. The door was open, so I let myself in. He gestured to the melted lock, his thin smile revealing gray, shark-like teeth. That's a little joke. I also had some light reading while I waited for you to finish dinner. Did you order the lamb? Order the lamb. It's mwah. Anyway. He held up the journal, waving it in my direction. Now this, this is a real page turner. Smart thing too, isn't it? Easy contact with your boss. He tapped it. Testing, testing. This thing on? My little joke. I know it's not how it works. And in just a minute, I'll leave you to write up a full report to the head honcho. I rolled my eyes. Let me guess. You're here to make me an offer or recruit me into some scheme of yours? Hades cocked his head, seeming genuinely puzzled. Recruit you? Why would I do that? And no offense, sweetie, you seem like a great girl, and you certainly have a way with words, and who would know words better than a sweaty, slimy, carnival huckster? But not to my eyeballs, immortal servants. You think I'm out there trying to fleece the rubes before closing, but yeesh, you people can't sell your souls fast enough. I got a line of schmucks from here to Tenarium waiting to sign the paperwork. Anyway, anyway, no. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the organ grinder, not the monkey in a hat. You're just the messenger, toots. Tell him... Before I could blink, he had crossed the room, his face mere inches from mine. He leaned in so close that I could hear the crackle of the blue flames, and whispered in my ear, I know what he's looking for. Leaning back, he resumed his previous animated tone. I'm kind of an expert in these things, after all, and thanks to this... He waved the journal at me again. He knows what I want. So, how about it, big guy? You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your visit, honey bunch. Relax, there's the sauna, hit the gym. He tossed the journal back to me. After you finish your report, of course. Ciao. With a flicker of blue flame, he vanished from the room. I want adventure in the great wide somewhere. I want it more than I can tell. So why did you come, did your heroes come to Olympus, other than you are a big Greek mythology nerd, your players love Percy Jackson, whatever, (laughs) whatever, the mist scooped them up and dumped them in a realm of bronze shields and mighty heroes. <laughs> there are a squajillion reasons. That is the exact number of Woo! reasons why you might come to Olympus. It's kind of like we're talking about with Coco with the um, lines between uh-huh. the, the material plane and the ethereal plane uh-huh. being thin. Here we've got kind of the lines between people and the gods being thin that you can go mm. and commune with the gods and the oracles and the temples. So if you've got religious PCs, uh-huh. that would be very appealing to them. It could even be cool if it's like 
they hear that it's a place where you can get, like, oracles and prophecies. Mm, mm-hmm. Like, you go to these temples, and these temples can give you oracles about the future. Yeah, especially if they have some kind of baggage with the Vistani. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want to deal with that. Speaking of the border uh-huh. of the ethereal being thin, there is a literal entrance to the underworld. Yes, there is. So, if you want to have a journey to the underworld like uh-huh. Hercules, then you can go to Olympus and do that. If uh-huh. there's, you know, a, a dead person you need to talk to or something like that, then, then Olympus gives you the chance to do that. There is in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, there, I don't know if it's the Oesibus or Oesibus or what, but, like, the cult of Oesibus. Mm-hmm. And the idea is they're, they're, like, making them as a new sort of big bad of the setting. Mm-hmm. That they're, like, this cult devoted to, like, necromancy and studying death and trying to become immortal. And there's, like, a perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. For if you have them as a setting element, this is a perfect place to have some kind of conflict with them, some kind of like origin of them, some kind of information about them. You can go to the library and find the ancient scrolls detailing how the cult got started, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. And then a big thing with it is that there are so many plot hooks inherent to uh-huh. Greek mythology that you're going to be able to work with. You could be wanting to get a golden fleece. Uh-huh. You could need to go get a Medusa head for something. Mm-hmm. An NPC has been petrified by a Medusa. This is where they come from. You can go and you know explore that. There, are, you could you could find out that you know, somebody that you know and love is about to be sent into the labyrinth to get eaten by the Minotaur, uh-huh. along with six other young men and seven <laughs> other young women. You have so yeah, many yeah. fun Greek mythology adventure hooks you can mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. Here. It's just, yeah, and it's the great thing of just a lot of your PCs are going to have that basic familiarity. It's not going to be completely new and completely like confusing, like, okay, what do I do with this? Mm-hmm. They're going to get the story that they're in, but yeah. with a kind of a fun, cool twist, a cool flavor you don't see as much in D&D stuff. And yet even like... We were talking about Athens and the and the Ponzi philosophers, uh-huh. and it, it might be that there's like a wizard you need to talk to, and he's in Athens. So you got you got so many choices. Yeah, yeah. So once you get there, similarly as the million plot hooks have suggested, there are a million like things and mm-hmm. threads you could pursue. There are monsters to fight. There are labyrinths to deal with. There are quests to go on, and golden fleeces to rescue. Labors, twelve labors to accomplish to get some kind of like epic boon, or you make up. You could do the full Hercules and have, like, in order to kind of get some cosmic forgiveness or pay some cosmic debt, your PCs need to do these 12 labors. And There are horses to steal, but mm-hmm. then plot twists, they're flesh-eating bum, horses. Bum, bum. So a lot of this is going to get you involved with Hades very easily. And you don't have to have Hades. You could have just, you know, do an, do an Odysseus and just knock around islands and fight Cyclopses <laughs> and stuff and get turned into animals. Mm-hmm. But to engage with the core of the setting, it's very easy to bring Hades into conflict with your yes. PCs. Because we said the great thing is, in this setting where hero, I'm, I'm quoting fingers, <laughs> is like a job class and you put on your tax form. <laughs> and... <laughs> PCs are very much going to slot into that and be seen and be treated by the local populace as heroes. That gets Hades interested because of this prophecy we've set up. Mm-hmm. So what? even just them bopping around from island to island to island, getting turned into pigs and fighting cyclopses and doing that is like going to in our version of this that and draw Hades' attention. Yeah. And Hades is in the background. And he has his ultimate plan to unleash the Titans. But I love this. The movie gives us this. We have where the scene where we introduce Meg. And it's the whole that he's trying to get her to recruit Nessus, the like the centaur, the river guardian. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I want to recruit her for the uprising. And now I'm centaurless. And there's a line, like he sends all these monsters to fight Hercules. And there's some line about how like, these are the monsters I was recruiting to help with my uprising. Mm-hmm. So you've got this wonderful like pre-Titan freeing phase when the PCs can step in and be thwarting a lot of the lesser plans of Hades. Yeah. So he's trying to recruit powerful spirits, powerful monsters. He's trying to find, like, makes sense he's trying to find magic items or, like, scraps of lore. Uh, you even have a Meg as an example of the idea of mortal agents. Mm-hmm. So just amazing source of plot hooks. And antagonists for your PCs. And like any given monster you run into, it can be either that Hades has recruited them and they are working for Hades, or Hades tried to recruit them and they're, now they're just like super annoyed at that yeah, like yeah. used car salesman schmuck Hades. <laughs> and like if they find out that the PCs are are working against Hades, then they, you might actually be able to like get them to work with you a little bit because oh man, that guy he comes on way too strong, <laughs> <am I> right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's just so great. You have all this Hades as a plot engine that is going to be clashing with the PCs and that is going to be driving stuff toward them even, which fits mm -hmm. that kind of tragic fate. The whole, like, he was being such an obnoxious jerk to the person that could have helped him do his plan that it drove them into helping the PCs instead and overthrowing them. Medusa didn't fall off the turnip truck yet. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah. on. So now I'm, and once you get that cool, like you're all ready for the Medusa fight, then she's like, Hades, I hate that guy. <laughs> How can I help you defeat him? And it's going to be so much fun for your PC. Uh -huh. like, Wait, Hades, I hate that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it'll stop you in, Hades. Hades, I don't work for Hades. I hate that guy. Oh, great. You know, I did what you wanted. Now I have snakes for Eric. Or <laughs> this is not the deal I was imagining. <laughs> and the great thing is, since this is all part of Hades' torment, like, the metaphysics of this setting, the dark powers are working behind the scenes to make these, like, ironic comeuppances happen. Yes. And the PCs get to be, can be an integral part of the dark powers' ironic comeuppance. Mm -hmm. Um, I just realized, you know, who's really gonna hate Hades is going to be a very high-level bar uh, <laughs> who you can absolutely, like, recruit to your Yes, cause yes. Because Hades still has his wife down in the He's being a real jerk about He's it. He's being a real jerk about it. Like, oh man, you can have a thing. Or, like, you're trying to go and recruit Orpheus yes. and help you play Hades. Because Orpheus hates that guy. And then you get, like, Orpheus' talking, singing head. And you <laughs> carry, carry him around. Orpheus's head. <laughs> and it is like a bardic weapon of mass destruction. Of you can just like point, point Orpheus's head at someone he can level 20 bard them. I love Greek mythology so It's much. so good. And once again, that, that, it's not just like, there is a random myth about this thing. And your players are like, oh, that's cool. They're like, ah, it's Orpheus. We found Orpheus. Orpheus's severed head. His animate singing head, and he's really mad at Hades, and is, like, totally on board helping us mess up Hades' plan. But now the Bacchae are chasing us everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, whole, the whole campaign, just so Yeah, funny. right. Or even just, like, it's not just a random monster. It's, like, Medusa. Mm -hmm. And turns out Medusa hates Hades yeah. and is, like, helping us now, and that's super mm -hmm. cool. We've mentioned a couple times that uh, Mystic Odysseys of Theros, the, this is a great book. It's a great resource. I would not want to run this without that book, if for nothing else than the monsters mm. and the player races. So, like, that gives you the satyr. Mm. I think that gives you centaurs. And that gives you a ton of... So it gives you, like, a golden fleece ram. Oh, nice. That gives you hydras. That gives you... And a lot of those monsters might be more in classical D&D, but part of Theros is trying to give you a bit more of a, like classical Greek version mm. of those monsters. Mm -hmm. So a bit more of a classical Greek Hydra than like a monster manual, a standard monster manual Hydra. And also it's got some great maps, like maps of temples and maps of cities and like maps you can use for like a Greek flavored dungeons. And it has a bunch of like backgrounds and subclasses that you could, you could pull in, especially if, if you want to have PCs from Olympus. Mm. So I know they had, I believe it was like a, for fighter and it was a wrestler. And oh, it was nice. a lot of, like, grapples and holds and stuff. Or uh, I believe it was a version of Paladin, which is basically, like, you're a Paladin of Arete. You're a Paladin of greatness, ah, nice. of glory. And that's kind of all your Paladin stuff is about achieving glory. Mm -hmm. And that's just, they give you this cool flavor stuff, and you could take that. And all you need to do to run all of Mystic Odysseys of Theros in this setting is just change the gods. <laughs> So, once again, great resource if you're like, oh my gosh, I have to run that campaign with Orpheus's head and the Bacchae, then, like, get Theros <laughs> too, please. So, one of the last things we always like to do is then talk about aging it down and aging it up. Doing it for younger people, doing it for older people. And honestly, Disney's Hercules, Disney's spin on Greek mythology yeah, is, yeah. like, a fantastic way to discuss this. A fantastic, like, topic for that discussion. This is the only time that we're going to say anything is fantastic about Disney's spin on Greek mythology. Yes, yes, yes. But... I was there and not his wicked stepmother. Yeah. It was right there. And... and, and, and We'll be here all night. <laughs> He's hanging out, giving him a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. So, Aging Down, like, really obvious, be the movie, like, mm -hmm. mostly slapstick for the violence, mostly fisticuffs, and, and the big thing in terms of our version of the setting is, like, avoid the horror element, mm -hmm. which is that horror of fate. 
that like that horror of fate and the idea of that whole thing we set up that kind of makes this really amazing from our perspective of you are a hero, you have a tragic flaw, you are doomed to your death. Which is not not for kids. Kids, this is just a cool setting with a spooky bad guy and maybe slightly creepier monsters than in the movie. You could do with kids, you could have fun with a tragic fate if it's like they don't have the tragic fate. PC, PCs are tragic fate less. Yes, yes, yes. But there are other people who do have tragic fates, but they can help them escape their tragic yeah, fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you could you could have a thing of, like, you know, maybe Hercules has the... He's fated to be killed by Hades. Uh-huh. But then the kids can find the loophole to the prophecy right. and save them. Right. Kids so do love finding loophholes in they prophecies. do love finding loopholes in everything. Like, ki- kids would love doing that whole... You made this deal with Hades, but part of the deal is that no harm would come to Meg, yeah. and she got smushed by a pillar. So now the deal's off. Like mm-hmm. they would, they would. There's a reason that 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 moment hits so well to adults or to kids watching the movie. Is that kind of like a kid <laughs> bedtime loophole? Oh, nonsense. they're so legalistic. They yeah. were, oh man, they'd love that. Yeah. So what about? I mean, basically, so aging down. Uh, do do the movie as uh, usual. As usual, yeah. Do the movie. What about aging up? What if you're like adults? who want to play this and who think Hades is cool and like Meg and it's a fun movie but are mad about the bowdlerization of mythology like, for example, they didn't make Hera his wicked stepmother. Yeah, um, I don't think we're going to have to do a skip ahead warning here. Future Rachel might come in and correct uh-huh. me, but I, I, y'all know what a bunch of the what a bunch of the adult content yeah. is going to be. I, we, can, we can just kind of like allude to it very easily uh-huh. and then move on. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, yeah, speaking of that stuff, um, yeah, uh-huh. Greek mythology. Session zero, the heck out of it, obviously. Yep. There's a whole lot of stuff that you can do that's playing into the more adult elements of Greek mythology. And not just the obvious, and then along came Zeus. Yeah, Greek yeah, mythology, yeah. But also even just, like, the gore uh-huh. that, like, Hercules' death was real nasty mm-hmm, in Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. Just, just, that that kind of thing. The the tragedy, the unfairness, like mm-hmm. playing up the tragic fate. I remember the first time I read the whole like Theseus yeah. returning home and forgetting to swap out the sails. That was just so monstrously unfair mm-hmm. and I hated it. Uh-huh. But if you want it to feel Greek and aged up do that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's the world that this is. Mm-hmm. If this is a Greek mythology horror setting. Yeah. That this this is a world of tragic fate. Like, play up the tragic fate. Play up the one stupid mistake is going to ruin everything. Anytime they say anything that's just, like, a goofy little mistake, uh-huh. you can come back and bite them on the rear yeah. end. Let them know that that's what we're doing. Yes, yes, that's like, part of the session zero. That's part of the session zero. It's nice, I think, that normally some of these things would be kind of annoying things for a DM to do, mm-hmm. but the fact that it's specifically, like, ancient Greece, mm-hmm. and especially if you're very open session zero about, like, this is a world of Greek tragedy. Yeah. Of, like, if you are sitting at this table, if you are bringing your PC, you are at a Rex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we all know how it ended for him. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also like do a lot more stuff with kind of like the the morality that like Hercules, it is very like you got your clear heroes and your clear mm-hmm. villains. Greek mythology was not like that yes, at all. So. Like even even ignoring the fact that along came Zeus. Uh-huh. It, Hercules was a jerk. Jason was a jerk. Yeah, yeah. Theseus was a jerk. They were all jerks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know, again, you can you can get into some of that even with Hercules himself specifically. With getting into some of like the the gorier stuff that we mentioned, you know, like like what actually happened to Hercules, like the Hounds of Actaeon, mm-hmm. like Procrustes in his <laughs> magic bed, all that Google good it, stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's educational. It is. It's culture. <laughs> No, this is culture. Yeah. That's, I think, also where a lot, you know, besides the tragic face of this, where you can bring in a lot of the horror and playing that stuff up, like really, really playing up those horror elements, because it, it is all there mm-hmm. with Circe. If you want to have Circe, really bring in that body yeah, horror. Yeah, yeah. Um, with Medusa, there's a hammer horror film called The Gorgon, yeah. and I saw it when I was, like, seven, <laughs> and if you see that movie when you are seven, Gorgons are the scariest freaking monster in the world for all time, <laughs> and, like, for just the horror of turning the stone, and in the movie, they turn to stone slowly, and they know what's happening, and there's nothing they can do about so it. It's a good, it's it's a good one. It's like, good. it's a real, it's good, like, yeah. a gem, uh, 
kind mm-hmm. of a mm-hmm. non-traditional gem of Hammer. Yeah. There's lots of opportunity to just take these, like, grislier elements of Greek mythology mm-hmm. and do that to turn this into a capital H horror setting. Because that's, that's kind of the thing as we've been describing it, you know, that's been missing other than the tragic face uh-huh. stuff. But it sure isn't missing from Greek mythology. That is and, true, yes. Yeah, and you can, you can definitely bring that stuff in. The other thing with the, the, the kind of Sessions year we elements, this movie, wow. Um, mm-hmm. it's, the, we need to get those characters some water because they're all very thirsty. Yeah, right. Um, like pain and panic turning into the horse with that's the Pegasus. Weird, that's and a like weird scene. Meg, like, yeah, like bending yeah. over all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that even fits some of the, the Hades interacting with the PCs. The idea is he might try some kind of form of seduction. Mm-hmm. And he's got these mortal agents. It was kind of Megs are kind of an example here. He might have kind of an equivalent of Meg, who acting as kind of a spy and this kind of agent of seduction. And once again, that's going to be giving your your, your PC shouldn't be surprised by this because if, if yeah. they're doing Hercules, yeah, that they're right going to have the they're going to have a Meg of their own who's going to be working for Hades and kind of manipulating them. Yeah, she's she's acting in the role of a succubus. Yes, like yes, yes, yeah. So whether you want to play this with younger kids that like Hercules and whether you want to play this with older adults who like Hercules and very have very complicated feelings about it because it was a lot of fun, but they know more about Greek mythology now. <laughs> we hope we've given you something you can uh, build on what we think is a fantastic campaign setting for either of those demographics. And then we will wrap our discussion of this fantastic campaign setting and we'll give you our parting thoughts in a section we like to call Parting Thoughts. So the first thing we always like to talk about is the genre of horror. It's not slasher this time. It's not slasher this time, finally. (laughs) Our long slasher-filled section is finished. So this is Venerton Guide to Ravenloft. They go through each domain. They establish these genres of horror, and they talk about using those genres to guide the horror. Like what sort of expectations, what sort of signifiers. It's a fantastic section just for any horror GM of any game. And there's one I think we've Mm -hmm. got a real, real Mm -hmm. obvious... It's not slasher, but there's something I think in common with Londinium. Not the genre. So the obvious genre, I think, is cosmic horror. Yes. Because we even said the core horror of this domain, as we are imagining it, is life is unfair. Yeah. And not just unfair, but like... Cosmically unfair. Cosmically. Not even unfair in terms of neutral, but unfair in terms of the universe is actively malevolent yeah. toward you. Like the universe is bending itself to bring about a tragic outcome. And to make it ironic. Mm-hmm. The unkindest cut of all. Yes. The little cherry on top of the Sunday of re- is it's not even just you're going to fail and die. It's you're going to fail and die and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> and anything you try to do to, to not fail and die is going to be the thing that leads you to failing and dying. Yeah. You know, 100%. This is this is like Jungle Book levels of obvious. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Kind of with what I meant by common Londinium mm-hmm. is that I think the second genre is one of those there is not one obvious second genre. I disagree with you. Okay, I, uh, what do you what do you got? What do you think? I think that dark fantasy is uh, the, but yes, because yes. there are such like big fantasy monsters. Yeah, like, Greek mythology monsters aren't horror monsters. That's like, very if you're true. Fighting, you know, Medusas and Hydras and stuff. It's going to feel more fantasy. Than that is very horror, true. Yeah. A lot of the aesthetics too are things we associate with fantasy. Yeah, like just having togas, having bronze shields, having helmets with big like horsetail plumes on them mm-hmm. is going to be like the little cheek guard things. Is going to like feel very dark. Oh, so yeah, no, I like think heroism and quests are, yeah. are like a built in part of the setting. Yeah, you're a hero and you're going to find the Golden Fleece and bring it back because mm-hmm. you're a hero. And that's very true. No, I, I think you're right, actually, now that now I think about it. But go ahead and pitch your uh, other, I was other genres pitch, you could put in. I was going to pitch basically it's one of those that because the setting's so rich, I think any genre could work. Yeah. So you mentioned Circe, and I was like, oh, body horror. Mm-hmm. And even like that's the thing. If you want to do a kind of Circe witch magical transformation. There's plenty of other magical transformations, too. You want to turn into a mm-hmm. long tree or something. Yeah, or we just talked about the Gorgon. Yeah, yeah. The that's a big movie, yeah. big body horror element. Yeah, mm-hmm. You're slowly turning into stone. <laughs> just read off it. Off it'll give you all the body yeah, horror right. you want. Yeah. Or the, you know, you could do 
slasher if you are in a labyrinth with mm. a minotaur mm-hmm. hunting you. That's basically yeah. a slasher movie. He's just a uh, Jason with horns. <laughs> and you could even do something like psychological horror if you really want to play up the like. Anyone could be an agent of Hades. Mm. Anyone, you know, all the people that are being nice to you and friendly are actually Megs. You could even do a kind of mm-hmm. a paranoia game. So it's one of those pretty much any yeah any setting you could any genre of horror you could make uh, a story an adventure in this setting that's that genre of horror we had to cut it but tom was uh, accidentally saying series instead of seriously yes. a couple times there was maybe think you could even do like a disaster horror where you do hades and Persephone, yeah, yeah and suddenly the world is plunged into endless yeah. winter and that's like his current plan is to kind of like freeze everybody and you have to go down and rescue persephone that's awesome yeah you could ah, that's awesome <laughs> or <laughs> this greek mythology you can do anything you can do anything <laughs> or, or even series they have a kind of goddess of the harvest in theros and mm-hmm. And with each of the gods, they have plot hooks mm-hmm. and having be an antagonist. And one of the plot hooks for her is like, there are villages in the hinterlands where they worship her in the old ways. And oh. so you could do your folk mm-hmm. horror too. You mm. could have Sumerisa coming in yeah. and we need to burn this to bring Persephone back. Yeah, or heck, you could do folk horror with the Bacchae. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Them. yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically Harvest Home. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely could do a Bacchae folk horror. You, you, you go to the nice village and then it's on the Feast of Bacchus. All the men make themselves real scarce. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wow, this is all ladies. Oh, more ladies for the rest of us. <laughs> oh boy, they sure are loading us up with one. Everybody's super drunk. Thanks, GM. This is going to be fun. Best session ever. It's not a party. Death by Snoo Snoo. It is not a party. You think it's a party. It's not a party. It's the flipping Bacchae. Frickin' bop. Come You're going to get torn apart and eaten. The death is not by Snoo Snoo. Uh-huh, yeah. So, yeah. So, anything. But I think you're absolutely right in terms of the, like, dominant... And even a lot of those other genres are going to be sort of dark fantasy flavor. So this isn't Jason with a machete chasing you through the <laughs> labyrinth. It's a minotaur chasing yeah. through the labyrinth. So yeah, absolutely. We also have to talk about what kind of game you can run in this setting. I believe we've tipped our hand. <laughs> we've not tipped our hand. We've like flipped it over and waved it in front of your face here. Like, <laughs> like we already laid the cards on the table. Yeah. Like we called. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're just, we're kind of holding our cards reverse in reverse. Mm-hmm. So... And all all of Greek history has given yeah, us right. a royal flush. <laughs> like there is some settings that are full campaigns, like Barovia. Obviously, you have Curse of Strahd. You can play for years and years and years just in Barovia, or like this one where you can mm-hmm. just play years and years and years. There are also other settings that are really more for one core adventure, like Odier with evil puppets, which is not this one because this is one of the full campaign ones. <laughs> So yeah, this is, oh good heavens, this is, you could run literally a decade of ancient Greece horror adventures. Like, geez, I even just realized we were talking about, you know, last last month we were talking about Jungle Book being the main one where you could do like a West March or game, but if you yeah, wanted absolutely. to be playing the Odyssey, then you could do that here absolutely, too. Absolutely, like, yeah. Literally, any game, in, you, you you could do Borka or you could do the C&E. Like, you, you got your do, high politics or your West Marches. Yeah, you could have an Athens with, with philosophy and politics and like cutthroat intrigue and mm-hmm. elections. Sparta with your big proving your manly buff screaming Jared Butlerness. <laughs> you could do it's like a hex crawl, but it's an island crawl. And yeah, you have your yeah. sea map and you have mm-hmm. your ship and you're just going from zone to zone, fighting krakens in some zones and discovering mysterious islands of lotus eaters in other zones. Mm-hmm. Like literally years of campaigning just in this setting because it's flipping ancient Greece. Uh-huh. And that is this immensely rich ancient Greek mythology, this immensely rich narrative wellspring to draw yeah. from. I mean, Rick Riordan got five books out of it. Yeah, so. right. More, way more than that now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. And the great thing is, yeah, you can do this sort of hex crawl rolling up random encounters with the ancient Greek monster encounter tables. But I think this is even stronger than that in terms of of scale, because you have that theme of fate and tragic flaw. Yeah. And that kind of makes a thematic through line that can be carrying you from, like, island to island to island to Mm -hmm. island. There's always that through line of fate and of tragic fate and of tragic flaws that you have, you know, your, your PCs have their flaws in their character sheet. And just keep having those flaws not just be like a cool role-playing detail, but like a thing that's majorly hindering them. Mm-hmm. And th- it communicating through your gameplay that this is a flaw that is going to destroy them. Yeah. In fact, unlike ODR, we said this is not just a one-shot, but this is one of those ones where I think doing it as a one-shot would almost be a disservice. Yes, Because definitely. you can't really explore and dig into and have an organic uh, way 
that theme of fate and of tragic flaw. Like, you can't really get a full cycle of Hercules Mm -hmm. that you could with a, like, multiple, many, many, many dozens, dozens, dozens of sessions campaign. Like, you're going to want to be here for at least a couple months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You have, as we mentioned, plenty of opportunities. Put in as many islands as you want, as many cities as you want. You want the, you know, noble... Wonder Woman, Paradise Island, like Island of Magical Warrior Women Mm -hmm. (laughs) with a black-haired flying bullet repelling queen, (laughs) then you could absolutely do that. And the great thing is, any kind of random weird island of weird stuff, even if it's not something directly from, like, the Odyssey or the Mm -hmm. Argonauts, will fit the feel. Yeah. Like, it'll fit the flavor. Any of the Ghost of Salt Marsh Ash, the, like, random island table, or your Mm. rolling any of those would fit feel not out of place in an Odyssey campaign Mm -hmm. or any kind of like weird, you know, there's no Greek mythology as far as I know about weird Greek harvest festival human sacrifice people, but you could do that. If I told you there was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't Mm -hmm. be confused or not, or disbelieve me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Village. I'm not familiar with that one, but the one about the village that would sacrifice people to the, the harvest gods. (laughs) And obviously the core adventure is you're stopping Hades from doing something. Yeah. He's got some kind of plan and his action leads you to stopping him. So you are going to stop him. That's the great thing. This is not one of those like, oh, this setting says you're, you're, you're out of luck. Like the mm-hmm. setting says you, you, the PCs lose. No, the setting actually says you win. Yes. The setting says you will beat Hades, but there will be some kind of tragic ending, tragic price that derived from your flaw. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like if the movie stopped after Meg's yeah. death, <laughs> we didn't have the go in the underworld yeah. get back. And we're putting this here, even though it doesn't really fit, because we don't really have anywhere else to put it. This is kind of like when we were talking uh-huh. about the Lunar Chronicles in the Snow White episode. <laughs> just kind of threw it into AUs. But this is a possible thing to have in an adventure, so we're going to go ahead and put it here. Uh, there was a book called Starless by Jacqueline Carey. Really good, very cool, kind of like standalone fantasy novel, really interesting gender stuff, and absolutely fantastic disabled character rep. But there's a thing in there where there's a magic item, and I don't remember what it's called, but you can use it to change your fate. It's this incredibly powerful magic. It was like a, a vial of liquid, and you throw it down, and you break the vial, and the liquid escapes, and you, you throw it down, and you yell, change my fate. And it'll change your fate, but you don't know what it's going to mm. change it to. And that would be a really cool MacGuffin to throw in. Yeah, yeah, setting. yeah. The idea that, you know, you know you have a tragic fate. You can go, and you can find this thing, and you can change your tragic fate. Hades probably really wants this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it's going to change his tragic fate, but the thing is, it can change it to something else that's just as tragic. Uh-huh. So that, that could be a really interesting thing to throw at your PCs, and even, like, doing a thing where if they want to change something about their character, maybe they shatter this thing to change their fate, and now suddenly, like, their flaw or their ideal or their bond is different. Because they've shattered this mm, thing. That's um, cool. Yeah. The great thing with this is you're describing this, and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm imagining random PCs, and in my experience, PCs really part of like the power fantasy of D&D is the sort of not having rules, not having restrictions. So if you tell PCs this is a domain of tragic fate... Like, you are doomed to a tragic fate. I feel like there's a good number going to be like, oh, well, how do I get out of that? Yeah. What's yeah. the loophole? How do I get out of that? Like, mm-hmm. and that's going to be their number one priority just because they really don't like being to get kind of told what to do. Yeah, yeah. So, and you say, oh, there is this magic liquid that will let you change your fate. It's the only thing that lets you change your fate. I feel like there's a good number of PCs that's all you need to do is tell mm-hmm. them this exists and that'll become their priority be finding this liquid. Mm-hmm. And you're very upfront about like, it might be better, it might be worse. You don't know. It's going to be like, it's chaos. Like mm-hmm. this thing is like pure chaos. Yeah. Maybe even connect it with the Titans. That idea of this sort of, this is pure chaos. This is pure uncertainty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is yeah. like. Yeah, the, it, it could totally come with the Titans. I yeah, love yeah. that. But this, this is like a piece of that primordial pre-Zeus world of pure chaos that's not locked into the order of fate. And they're gonna go and do it. And once again, it's that GM magic trick slash horrible dark Greek fate magic trick of like, your choice is leading to this happening. And your attempt to avoid this dark fate is going to be the thing that lets me impose the dark fate on you. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're gonna get that pushback just yeah. saying, no, there is, I, I think even if they don't end up getting it or pursuing it, it'll take some of the sting out saying, no, there is this way around. Yeah, yeah. 
like, you're not locked into these rules of this setting. There is a way to defy the rules of the setting. There's, like, kind of the equivalent of a wish spell. Yeah. So, one of the reasons this is such a fruitful setting for us is because, as we said, we have literally an entire canon of pretty well-known mythology to draw on, but also because this is a huge unfulfilled mm-hmm. niche in Ravenloft, and not just in 5e Ravenloft, but really in any iteration of Ravenloft. Yeah. So, Rachel, are there... Any old material you could connect this to. Okay, this is another one where I have, like, a really big paragraph here, so I'm sorry if this, like, goes yep, just... into, like, Great Mouse Detective. Level <laughs> stuff. But the one place where they did touch on Greek mythology in previous iterations of Ravenloft actually was when we were talking about Great Dark Lords and Not-So-Great Dark Lords. Um, I mentioned Althea. And she, like... Technically, it wasn't 100% clear whether or not she was a Dark Lord, but she was totally a Dark Lord. Uh-huh. And she was a Medusa, and her domain was this island called Demise off the coast of Lamordia. And you would shipwreck on Demise, and you'd go in, and it would, there was this labyrinth full of, like, amazingly detailed statues. And... Every single one of the statues, the people had faces frozen in expression of terror and agony. So, <laughs> That's you know, awesome. This is, this is totally fine. Um, I was like, I love that. And just you're wandering through the labyrinth, and then you become, like, gradually aware of Althea, and she's picking you off one by one. But the thing with Althea is she has been alone in the labyrinth, turning everyone she sees to stone for her entire life. So she is desperately lonely, and she wants a mate. Mm. So she fixates on one of the PCs and is picking the other ones off one by one, but like is kind of like bringing them to the other PC like a cat bringing them mice <laughs> to be like you know look look how look how cool and powerful I am I'm gonna be a great wife to you for with how cool I am like <laughs> that's pretty awesome she oh yeah she is it's an amazing dungeon uh-huh. it's an amazing adventure. But I don't even know for sure that she's a Dark Lord because she doesn't have a backstory. Mm. So, like, that's, that's the reason that Althea is not, like, you know, an awesome Tier 1 Dark Lord. is because mm. I have no idea what her act of ultimate darkness is. No one is. The writers don't know what her act of ultimate <laughs> darkness is. But it's you, you could absolutely bring Althea in and have Demise be one of these islands in Olympus. There is in my giant paragraph yeah. I mentioned here, we've got all caps here. Gwiddy and Gwiddy and Gwiddy and Gwiddy and Gwiddy and Gwiddy and so much Gwiddy. It's written five times and then again another time, and I'm looking at the script right now. Yes, it, yes she's, no. not exa- she's not exaggerating. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a comical exaggeration, dear listener. I love Gwiddy and guys. I yeah, really she love- really does. <laughs> Thomas yeah, played can, in... Yeah, can, can confirm. Thomas played in two campaigns of mine where the big bad was Gwydion. Uh-huh. So... Two Gwydion boss fights. <laughs> yes. So, Gwydion, I believe in 5e it mentions that there's, like, the domain of fae that's within Tepest, right? There's, there's I think something so, about yeah. there being, like, a, a fae domain that's kind of, like, hidden underneath Tepest. And in the older material, it was its own domain called the Shadow Rift. And it was just this, like, giant gaping hole in the middle of the core. And so the thing with Gwydion, and the reason why he's on here five times, because (laughs) Faye and a... In all caps. In all caps. Faye and a big shadowy abyss don't necessarily, like, logically connect to Olympus, is because Gwydion actually is a god. Mm -hmm. And he's a god who is trapped in a portal trying to break free. Kind of like the Titans. Mm-hmm. So, because the whole thing with Gwydion is he actually created the Shadow Fae as the servitor race. And so, Gwydion lies dead and dreaming. Uh-huh. But he's he's eventually, you know, he's trying to break out and, like, kind of reaching in and subtly controlling things around him. And his curse is that he knows that he's stuck. And he, you know, the most powerful being in the entire core, but he's impotent. And so, like, you know, number one, this this was a thing that gave us, like, a precedent for having a god be a Dark Lord. Uh, number two, he's a monster trapped in a portal trying to get free. It's really easy to tie that in with the Titans. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could have it be that, like, maybe he is a Titan. You could have it be since he is a one of his things is, like, 
he can reach out subtly and he's like casting suggestion mm-hmm. and controlling some of the fae through their dreams and everything like that. He could be trying to get some of the shadow fae to sort of like reach out and make contact with Hades. Or Hades could be trying to make contact with Gwydion. Like, you know, imagine what Hades would do to have a being like a Titan, but he could actually talk to it and plan with it and figure mm-hmm. out how to make it escape. If he can get Gwydion out, he can get the Titans out. Mm-hmm. So he would, he would really want to be conspiring with him. Speaking of, one of the great things with Hades is that he is going to tie in so well with so many Dark Lords because who among the Dark Lords doesn't want to change their uh-huh. fate? Like, especially if you've got this fate change in MacGuffin. Just about any Dark Lord who yeah, has, yeah. like, any awareness of the situation they're in is going to eat that up with a spoon, uh-huh. especially Azalyn, uh-huh. which, you know, as we just dropped a great big adventure hook in the in the yep. D fiction, because, once again, Hades knows Azalyn is also working night and day to escape his fate, you know, to, to change his fate and to, mm. to break free of these, like, cosmic beings that are binding him in this place he doesn't want to be bound. So even if you're not basing your campaign out of Olympus, if you're basing it out of Darkon or Barovia or, you know, Haslan or any other place where the Dark Lord has this kind of metaphysical awareness, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to work in an alliance with that Dark Lord in Hades or an attempted alliance with that Dark Lord in Hades really easily. You absolutely could have a Curse of Strahd connection with, like, mm-hmm. Strahd hears that in Olympus there is this magic item that lets you change your fate. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't know all the metaphysics of, like, you know, the, the domain and the dark powers and everything. But, you know, it's very possible to do a version of Strahd that has, like, come to realize he's cursed. Yeah. And, you know, he thinks of it as a curse. And he hears about this item and interprets it as, it can break my curse. Yeah. So that that can be the hook that gets the PCs there if they're coming in from Barovia. Is maybe they're doing getting it for Strahd, they agree to get it for Strahd in exchange for something else. Or even maybe they're like agents of Strahd after it and they're like, oh, we have to get it first. <laughs> Classic PC behavior. Classic we have PC to get the MacGuffin before the bad yes. guys get the MacGuffin. And then, yeah, speaking of fate, one thing we haven't talked about is the fates. Yeah. They do show up in the movie. And it really feels like they should be connected to the Vasani somehow. Mm-hmm. Just that, you know, there are these there are these women who, like, see the future and give, you know, vague prophecies and whatnot. Like set things in motion. Mm-hmm. And then... It really seems like they should be connected to the Vasani. So... Even if it's just having the fates appear as three Vistani women, like, I can't believe I'm going uh-huh. to... Pre- I guess this is something else that we can take from Tower of Doom, which yep. is a gaming thing, but you could have it be the fates of these three Vistani women who are, like, clearly maiden mother on crone animals. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Then that that really feels like it fits. So, like, no, it's, it's Olympus, but it's in Ravenloft. An Easter egg for Tower of Doom, if you were <laughs> really looking for a way to, to work that in. And it... It feels like the Vistani in general should have some kind of, like, strong connection to Olympus because of all the fate stuff. I'm not quite sure what that connection is. Like, if you have any ideas, yeah. please let us know. Because maybe something where they're working against Hades because, like, if the Titans get loose, then all that chaos is really going to mess up the site. Like, mm. they're not going to be able to, to have you know, seeing the past and the future anymore. Um, but it feels like there should they should have some kind of relationship with Olympus. I don't know what it is. But maybe you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can't do all the work for you, okay? <laughs> We're not selling you one of them 5e full made campaigns, okay? This is free. <laughs> so, I've talked enough. Yes. About Quidian. <laughs> about. And other about people. Quidian. And other people. <laughs> so, the last thing we always like to talk about is the strengths and the challenges. And I feel like we've also tipped our hand a little bit. It's so great! It's guys! so great. It's, it's mostly so strengths. Good. <laughs> mostly strength. The strengths, as we had a very long... I'm not going to repeat as much as I want mm-hmm. to, but I think Ancient Greece is a fantastic setting for a D&D game, just period. And that having the Theros book in 5D specifically, like, does a lot of the work for you. So you're like, oh, no, I need to homebrew a satyr. No, you don't. Your PC can be a satyr. They can be Grover from Percy Jackson. <laughs> and they did the work for you. Or like, oh, even some of the some of the spells or some of the backgrounds or stuff, they've done the work for you. And you have got a great villain in Hades. You know, a lot of the Dark Lords are great villains, but this is one that has this direct connection to the PCs, this interest in the PCs, and is like generating plots. Is very like actively going to generate plots for the PCs to deal with. And then, of course, you have 
literally centuries of mythology, very well-known mythology to draw from, which can give you cool stuff like monsters or places or evil murder beds. <laughs> but even more than that, it can give you just narrative beats that are going to feel right to, mm -hmm. to your to most of your pieces. They're going to resonate. They're going to resonate. So even just again, it's just completely, you know, it's kind of horrible curse on you and you go to the Oracle and you're like, oh yeah, the Oracle, cool, we'll go to the Oracle. Mm -hmm. And the Oracle says you have to do 12 labors. And if you complete these 12 like mythic labors, the curse will be lifted. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be like, this is railroady garbage. Yeah. They're going to be like, oh, oh yeah. Thatch quest. Ugh. The thatch quest. No, it's going to be like, oh yeah, that checks out. That mm -hmm. feels right. We're in a spooky cave with a lady in a toga and there's Doric columns everywhere <laughs> and everybody's got bronze shields and, and helmets with big horsetail plumes. It feels right that we do 12 labors and this curse is lifted. Like, that fits. And that is a wonderful thing as a GM to have. That immediate kind of a buy-in, that immediate sort of player acceptance of the narrative logic of the setting. And Ancient Greece gives you that, and so Olympus gives you that. Yeah. But there are some challenges, and we mm -hmm. have touched on some of those. Yes. So, Rachel, challenges? I think the biggest challenge is that the theme of fate can feel very real. Mm -hmm. Even if your players are on board with it, this, this sense of that their tragic flaw is eventually going to overcome them. It could feel railroady, and it could feel kind of nihilistic, and a mm. like, why by even coming to the table, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. going to end badly way. Like, so. it's easy to say you're on board with this, but especially because D&D &D normally is such a sort of power fantasy mm -hmm. of, like, freedom and control... And this is in direct opposition to that. It might be like, um, yeah, it's going to be so cool. We're going to be like, I'm an Oedipus. We're going to be tragic heroes. And it's going to have doom, doom. But then you're playing like, I don't actually want this. Like, yeah. this is actually kind of chafing me to know that I, I am tragically flawed, doomed. I like my character too much. I don't want this yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah. And just as a GM, you know, it's, it is going to take a delicate touch to make it feel like the character's choices matter. But they are still tragically doomed. So that's that's going to be difficult. This this tragic fate thing, it is like a very, very useful tool to put in a DM's toolbox, but it's one that could be misused very easily. Yes. Like, a very, uh, you know, it could be very easy to become a shortcut or a railroad or something that a heavy-handed DM can make the game not fun people. I, very delicate time. I could see people playing a game in this setting and leaving the table crying with frustration if they don't <laughs> do this right. The other thing, it's, it's not as big of a challenge because it's taken care of pretty easily with a session zero, but it's a, it's a less obvious kind of session zeroing thing, is that there is such a tonal disconnect between the Disney movie and its source material. Like, this is such a Disneyfication of Greek mythology. Yes, yes. And if you are doing kind of a, a Kingdom Hearts style like, yeah, Disney yeah, 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 campaign... Yeah, yeah. Or if your players know what that, like, Disney Hades is, the Dark Lord here, mm -hmm. then having, uh, like, Medea show up yeah. is going to be a big tonal disconnect. jarring, yeah. yeah. So just just making sure everyone's on the same page. And then you know, on the flip side, if your players are like, oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do, like, Greek tragedy, and I'm going to be this, like, big jerk who gets Ariadne to see me through the labyrinth and then ditches her and then Sissy's <laughs> Hercules. They're going to be real mad. And they're so, buying novelty sneakers. Yeah, yeah. Make sure everybody yeah, knows yeah. what kind of game you're playing. Yeah. This is one that, to make this work, it needs a very, very, very specific tone, even more so than a lot of other a lot of other things you don't have the obvious lean into the source material for tone because mm -hmm. we're almost like the tone's almost in conflict with the source yeah, material yeah like for me personally I think I would be doing it as straight up Greek mythology uh -huh. but with Disney's Hades as the Dark mm -hmm. Lord and I think mm -hmm. that's fine but yeah, again your, your, your table your tone and just make sure that it's your table and your player's tone all so, before we rejoin our narrator and find out where she's going next, if indeed she's going somewhere different, mm -hmm. how can they tell us what they decided to do in terms of connecting the Vistani with <laughs> this setting of Olympus and this theme of fate? Well, you can email us at wonderfulworldofdarklords at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook or on Tumblr at Wonderful World of Dark Lords. And between recording this and now, I finally figured out what was going on with Patreon, and so also we're Wonderful World of Dark Lords on Patreon! And if you join our Patreon, then you can 
chat about this in our Discord, which mm-hmm. is a fantastic place. Our listeners are so cool. I promise, They're like, so cool. <laughs> in 48 hours after this drops, there will be like a half dozen <laughs> really good suggestions for connecting mm-hmm. to Vistani. Mm-hmm. Like, we can't think of anything. I, I am our Discord people. They're going to throw out some ideas and we're going to be like, oh, dang, that was obvious, wasn't it? Like, every freaking time. Oh, wow. D- D- Should have thought of that. The inimitable Dusty Purple, who does our, our mm-hmm. bingo cards, like, Every time they do a bingo card for us, there'll be something on there that I'm like, oh. I wish I well, had put we that. We didn't do that, but yeah. we should have. <laughs> so. But no, I'm, I'm confident, like, within a day or two, there will be some cool suggestions about how to use the Vistani and connect them with Mount Olympus. Yeah. Or yeah. Olympus or the Fates or whatever. <laughs> so, if you join our Patreon, you get to you get to hang out mm. with all those cool people. If you like how we adapted some of the more horrific elements of mythology and into an interesting game, I've got a couple of horror movies adapted into... One Shot Adventures, and those are all on DMs Guild. If you just follow more by this author from the the right, the DMs Guild write up for this domain in the show notes. Go to DMs Guild, search for Tom Kohler. And also, if you like how we considered how you'd run this for kids that love Hercules, we also have some advice for running more like spooky horror themed stuff for kids, for younger players, which is also there under me, my stuff in the DM skill. Then, speaking of younger people, uh, I have a picture book, Mother Ghost Nursery Rhymes for Little Monsters. It's exactly what it sounds like. I also have my website, www.rachelkohler.com, where you can find the short stories I've written for adults, one of which does heavily feature classical mythology. Uh, if, if you go look at where I have the links all listed, you can find my short story, And to the Republic. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be my favorite short story I've ever read. I'm really proud of it. You sure it's really good. <laughs> Heads up, the protagonist is a terrible person. Huh. And one of the ways that she's a terrible person is there's some casual Islamophobia in there. I do not endorse it. That's just who she is. Mm. I'm sorry. So, until next time, which is uh, maybe, maybe. going to be something a little different from our, mm-hmm. our, our usual next time. It, it is. Thank you for listening, and happy gaming. Parting thoughts. While Olympus seems on the surface to be a haven for adventurers, it is a trap. The people are as fickle with their attentions as their gods once were, and whether it is the hand of fate or of Hades, a hero's downfall is all but guaranteed. I heard rumors during my stay of another, very different realm ruled by a god named Hades, a king on a chromium throne. Unfortunately, a visit there was impossible, for one cannot go to Hades Town without a personal invitation, and those who do go do not come back. I will send a report based on the tales I have heard before my next journey. I do not know whether Hades was speaking truthfully or bluffing when he said he knew your plans, he answered. I know you hold them dear, and dread your enemies getting hold of them. Is Hades the only one who knows? Will he attempt to use your secrets as leverage? I do not know, but I know that talking to Hades left an almost palpable layer of grease on my skin. As I entered the mists holding a tiny automaton as a talisman, I reflected that, as frustrated as I have been by my patron's opacity, Hades' slick gamesmanship is far more galling. Perhaps he expected me to convey his offer without comment, as though I were D, his personal messaging companion, or even to push you to reveal your plans in hopes that I could learn them. If so, that was his mistake. Regards, D. Bellerophon received a hero's welcome that makes the hospitality of the peasants of Barovia appear positively warm. Heroes and adventurers are rarely praised in these lands, for the denizens of the mist know that in time they will yield to corruption. These heroes of Olympus are nothing more than egotistical adventurers accomplishing feats of glory for the sole purpose of obtaining godhood. It would take a rare individual indeed to risk their life without the temptation of such a reward. Hades is a powerful entity merely claiming the title of a god, but much like the heroes of Olympus striving to ascend, Hades never shall and will always be nothing more than a glorified jailer. Unless, of course, one such as myself were to assist him. An intriguing prospect, but I sincerely doubt he knows much beyond the words of our continuing correspondence. After all, there are precious few who know my secrets, and those that do remain my most loyal servants. 
Making bargains with such a creature must be approached with extreme caution. Even the bargain he offers me, favor for favor, appears fair on the surface. But given his nature, such deal will, more often than not, fall in Hades' favor. Regardless, I trust my little scholar shall find what I seek in due time. You have shown me great loyalty in not only conveying the entirety of your encounter with Hades to me, but also deftly avoiding the temptation of knowledge he held before you. Hades may be more akin to a greasy salesman than a god, but he is no fool and would never regard you as a mere messenger, my dear. I have no doubt he hoped to appeal to your curiosity in these matters. Such loyalty shall not go unrewarded. You shall find the details of a new spell in your grimoire that shall further assist you in your journey. This has been The Wonderful World of Dark Lords. We have no affiliation with Disney or Wizards of the Coast. All music recordings used in this episode are in the public domain and were obtained through museopen.org. Titles and links are in the show notes. Dialogue for Yensid was written by Azalyn Rex himself, who you can follow on Tumblr at Dark Lord Azalyn. The Wonderful World of Dark Lords logo was designed by Haylight Jones. You can find links to their work in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, look for us on Patreon.com or find our tip jar on Red Circle. Thanks for listening! Which, once again, if you've got the right kind of group, yeah, gonna, they're mm. salivating at they're this right so now. Delicious. <laughs> they're like, hurt me, hurt me, DM, hurt me. <laughs> you need to put that in the aging up section. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so, kids won't know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> No, this is culture. Like, like <laughs> Rizzo and no, Corpus Christi. We're, we're saying the, 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 the DM is going to hurt them. Uh-huh. And we're like, oh boy, hurt me. You know, like Narcissa. Like, oh, I want Narcissa to hurt me. Yeah. That's how I want the DM to hurt me. <laughs>